bases dropped on a new edition of soccer down here. Excited to get going with a, kind of a crazy one. It's not going to be all Miguel on Hell Ramirez like it was yesterday, but yeah, there's more to talk about after the press conference that Zorn Carnetta gave and what he said and maybe what he didn't say. We'll, we'll get into that. We're going to talk about the U.S. men's national team and Morocco tonight. We do know what the lineup will be. We have a couple of other talking points for you. Uh, Bart Keeler will join us tomorrow to break everything down at 930. Um, lots of other rumors and things worldwide. Uh, right now, if you're looking for a live game to watch on a BN Sport Connect, which you can get to via Fanatis and many other things, but fntz.co slash soccer down here. If you're not a subscriber to Fanatis, you got U20 action with Javier Mascherano's Argentina against Panama. Second half just started. It is scoreless. You've got the finalissima later today with Italy and Argentina. You've got Scotland and Ukraine in a World Cup qualifying playoff match. So tons of things to get into today. We'll try to take some questions as well. Mike Conti will join us at 10 o'clock as well. Talk about the latest Atlanta United news, which sadly is not a surprise after seeing what happened with Ronald Hernandez and getting his knee kind of rolled up on as Bobby Shuttleworth fell into him. He's out for an extended period of time. So now there are some bigger questions about fullback depth because there's just not very many of them. Same at center back because there's just not very many of them at the moment because of the injuries. And yes, um, we'll talk about that. And just to go ahead and try to head this off at the pass, but I know there's already stories running and, and comments being made. A goalkeeper falling into a player's leg that injures a knee has nothing to do with turf or trainers or strength and conditioning programs or anything else. It was a goalkeeper falling into a man's leg. And I don't want to recreate that for anybody, but when somebody falls into the outside of your leg like that and your knee buckles, yeah, strength and conditioning is not going to matter a whole lot. Um, the turf doesn't have anything to do with it. It's a grown man falling on your leg that's exposed, and your knee is not going to be able to deal with that. Um, don't know what else to tell you. It stinks. It absolutely stinks. Um, also want to thank our good friends who support our opening kickoff here, Kickoff Coffee. Make sure you are following them on all your social media platforms. Go to kickoffcoffeeco.com. You can use the promo code soccer down here 15 to get 15% off of your order. But what I love about kickoff coffee, other than, than knowing the crew who got this organization started, it's, it's soccer people, um, good soccer people. who have had a lot of ties to the Atlanta area as well, but they take some of the money, 10% of the proceeds. They take that and invest it in soccer organizations that serve youth development. So if you are a youth development organization worldwide and you use soccer to help kids have a better life, Kickoff Coffee supports that and they put their money where their mouth is. It's just an amazing program. I love that that is part of everything that Kickoff Coffee does. Make sure you're following them. Go to kickoffcoffeeco.com. Use that promo code soccer down here 15. That'll get you 15% off and know that then 10% is going to go to help kids who need some extra programming, need some extra things to help them have a, a better chance, a better life. Um, we know all of us who are involved in, in the game, we know the power that it can have. Kickoff Coffee tries to harness that for good with organizations, and we're very happy to be a partner with them. We got to start, guys, with this uh, press conference that Zoran Carnetta gave. Um, it was not public, and it has not been made public, at least as far as I have seen. Uh, extensively quoted by a number of people who were on the call, press conference, Zoom, what have you. I'm just going to give a couple of the quotes. Uh, Zorn Carnetta used the word speculate quite a bit, which is odd considering he's the one who made the decision. Uh, so there's really not much to speculate on since he did it, and he could explain why he did it. But he kept using the word speculate, which uh, just cue the Princess Bride quote and have fun with it. Um, he said there's not much point to speculate to what exactly happened. We made a decision for the best of the club. I wouldn't want to go into details. It's not going to help anybody. Some of you might think it's difficult to explain, but it happens in sports very often. We went through expansion teams and MLS. 
You can go a step further to teams in their first year if you want to include 1996 teams into it where there were three coaching changes in their first year. This is one of the earliest, and this is the one that had the most success, but he lost his job. That part doesn't happen in sports very often. I uh, kept saying consistently, decision best for the club. Um, like one of the quotes that has gotten a lot of play is, at the end of the day, we had no choice. We had to do it, which makes no sense whatsoever with where you look at where the team is. Now, we don't know everything going on behind the scenes, and Zorn Cornetta chose not to share any of that. Well, uh, John Hayes of The Athletic did share a little bit of this. Um he reported that a designated player said that he refused to play for Charlotte after the June international break if Miguel Angel Ramirez remained in charge. That is from John Hayes of The Athletic. The three designated players on the roster are Carol Swiderski, Camille Josviak, and Jordi Alcivar. Um, Cornetta was asked if Ramirez lost the locker room. I'm not going to comment on that, was what he said. Um Question about the relationship between Ramirez and the front office. Cornetta said, quote, I don't think there was any disconnect between the front office and Miguel. Like in any organization, there are often different opinions, but Miguel and I had a very good working relationship. Okay. Uh, Cornetta said that David Tepper was, quote, looped in, unquote, during the entire process. Decision made by, quote, the leadership group at the club. We've talked about how that group has, has changed personnel quite a bit. Um, LeBeau, uh, the new president of the club, would be the only other person I would know of who would have the clout here in this, along with Cornetta and, of course, David Tepper, who owns it. Um, they, Latanzio is going to be – Christian Latanzio is going to be the interim manager for the rest of the year. It's not a short-term thing. He's the guy for the rest of the season, and they'll figure it out. Uh, they didn't really have anything to say about an upcoming coaching search. Uh, for now, Christian is the head coach of the rest of the season. That's a given. We'll see what happens too early to discuss the coaching search. So we really didn't hear anything direct, uh, but now things are starting to pop up from respected sources about what's going on because the results don't tell you what's going on to any point to why this would have happened yesterday. If you have a designated player saying, yeah, I'm not going to play after the break if he's still there, that's a massive problem. Um, it's also, to me, taking those three designated players into account um, as to who it could be. And I think Charlotte fans have, have pretty much zeroed in on Swiderski as the one. And he's very demonstrative on the field. He uses a lot of body language to express himself, is, is maybe a fair way to put it. Um, as most fair as I can possibly be in that. That's been the one that has been zeroed in on. Any of the three, though, Jarrett, in my opinion, I don't know why any of them would have the clout to demand a coaching change 14 games in when said coach has somehow, and uh, I think the, the one of the local Fox sports directors had this, about how Charlotte internally has believed that they have overachieved, but somehow underachieved in their overachieving because of Ramirez, which if you can explain that to me, I'd love to hear it because I, I just got a headache trying to repeat it. Um, all of that said, how do any of those three players have the clout to demand a coaching change from somebody who has been involved in a team overachieving from expectations. Yeah. Jared had to duck out for a sec. He'll be right back. Okay. Well, you tell me then I'd like to be able to know uh, if ADP sits there and it's like, Nope, not going to do it. That's, that's a dangerous precedent period for this club, because if, a player has that kind of clout to determine who can and can't coach or, you know, you don't like a selection. That's a dangerous precedent. Sorry, right, one, one correction. Charlotte did post the whole press conference. Thank you, Chris Ashley. Uh, they, it wasn't available at live. I, I was looking for it. It wasn't available then. I didn't go back to check. So it is public. You can go watch it. I 
I don't know what you're going to learn from it because I don't think anybody really learned a bunch from it. Right. And that was the other thing. It's like if there's a press conference and you're not going to address anything, did you really have a press conference? But oh, they had it. No, they had it. There's quotes from it. Um, they absolutely had it. But I don't think they helped themselves. No. And, and and that's ultimately in a situation like this where the reaction is very negative. I did not see one positive, yeah, that needed to happen kind of comment after the move was announced yesterday. I frankly haven't seen one since. I'm not 100% dialed into the Charlotte fan base and commentary and all of that. But it has been much more of, I don't get it, uh, followed by, this is crazy, yeah. followed by, what in the world are they doing? Um, I've not seen anyone come out and say, yep, get it, that's the right move, let's go, good, good job. I haven't seen that from anywhere in the club. Now, again, not everybody knows what's going on behind the scenes, it sounds like. But man, if you've got this issue this early and the players or some players or a group of players, because many players have spoken very positively about Ramirez, and I don't think that's purely just PR trying to get him his good graces. If you have a subset of the roster making decisions on firing a coach who's won five games when nobody expected them to have five wins at this point and has generally had them very competitive throughout, uh, yeah, where does that go from here? And that's that's what I'm not really sure what happens next is just where can it really go from here? Because what happens if you hire somebody that, the one half of the locker room likes and then there's another part of the locker room that now what if they're the ones who get upset with it do they have clout to make a call do they have clout to to force a change i don't know it's just it's it's one of the most bizarre situations i've seen because of how unexpected that it was after the firing yesterday i made a point to listen to charlotte sports talk radio and specifically the flagship station of charlotte fc and I wanted to kind of hear what fans were thinking with this and those three tenets that you came up with in pretty short order were one, two, and three. And then it was also an excuse to completely and totally bash David Tepper for anything attached to Charlotte sports. Uh, Panthers were a part of it. Once again, Charlotte FC was a part of it. But yeah, David Tepper was getting beat up from pillar to post yesterday uh, is with this firing being somewhat typical for how things have been going for the Charlotte sports fans. Charlotte, how is it typical? Just there. They haven't fired the underperforming football coach, right? It just the, the overall frustration for things that are illogical okay. you know, where you haven't fired rule, but you fire Miguel on hell Ramirez. None of it makes sense to these, to the fans and the fans <laughs> feel embarrassed as fans of Charlotte sports teams because of things like this that are either happening or aren't happening, depending on which team you're talking about. So. Well, I, look, I, I, one thing I'll say is, I mean, the fans feeling on this doesn't drive what decisions the club has to make. It can't. Um, but I'll also say that a designated player and those three, their feelings shouldn't drive what the club makes as well. Mm -hmm. I don't think, um, I think there's very few players in this league or really any league who have that kind of clout to say, yeah, I'm not playing for that guy and have it actually come off. I don't think any of those three have that. We're, we're talking about three young guys yeah, and 14 total matches play in your first season. Yeah, I mean, I'm not worried about that so much in this conversation. You could play 40 matches. You could play 100 matches. Those three players don't have the standing to be able to make that call. I don't think. Um, but somebody did. If that's if that was why, is that purely why? I'd hope not. If that's purely why, then yeah, it's completely more dysfunctional than I would have ever guessed. If that's part of a conversation... Man, there's got to be a whole lot of other talk in the conversation. 
because it just it doesn't fit what we've seen on the field. It doesn't fit. And I my my fear for Charlotte fans is that they have dramatically overreacted and fired I think one of the best coaches in the league coaching I'm not talking the managing side I'm talking the coaching I think they fired one of the best coaches in major league soccer over maybe poor management maybe poor relationship building you know all kinds of different things and if the results weren't better than expected then okay then his coaching hasn't been good enough or the coaching's not clicking or whatever but it has and he's done a lot of different things in terms of of coaching it's not just been this is how we play this is how we play this is how we play it's one way that's it he's played a 442 diamond he's had to move things around he's had to adjust he's had to mix and match you know like i just i don't think this is a good sign for the long term health of the club under the leadership that they're under because it feels very knee jerk. Mm -hmm. It feels very knee jerk. Um, I mean, yeah, sure. Uh, Cassie, uh, Christian Latanzio, like he has a great CV. He's never managed a team before. So like if, if that, <laughs> if, if the, the decision-making goes designated player, doesn't want to play for the guy and doesn't like him. They think the assistant coach who's never managed a game before is a, a, the right person to be there instead of the person who's won a Copa Sudamericana and the person that they sold to everybody being as a, an amazing manager and one of the best. Again, A plus B plus C doesn't equal success there. It, it equals complete and utter chaos. Mm -hmm. Um. I don't know. I don't get it. I yeah, it's it Kessy, if that factored in, if if Latanzio's quality, I mean, maybe it just makes you feel a little bit better handing him the reins for now, but um if if they could seriously look at it and say they think they'll be better with Latanzio, who's never managed coaching and managing, assistant coaching and managing, two completely different things. If they think they'll be better off with him with no experience than Ramirez with what he's done. Then something is out of whack on all of the decision-making process. I'm, I'm just baffled. I'm just completely and utterly baffled by the whole thing. And I thought maybe we'd get a little more clarity, Jarrett out of uh, Zorn Cornetta yesterday, but we heard the word speculate about seven or eight times, which, he could have ended any speculation if he had wanted to, and he, he didn't. And I, I would assume that you're going to have things come out now. I mean, you're going to have more than, than John Hayes saying that a designated player didn't want to play for Ramirez. That feels like maybe the tip of the iceberg. And if you're not going to shut it down with a, a statement and be strong at the beginning, then what's going to happen here? It, it felt like it would the the entire call was like the most useful most uh most useless basically reason to have a press conference like if you're gonna have one don't sit there and say well we don't want to speculate dude you 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 did the thing yeah you don't like, have to speculate man. It, just it, tell it was, us why you it, did it it was the it, it was one of the biggest wastes of oxygen and words and i honestly like i thought if you like if you got a finger to the pulse of u.s soccer twitter that was the takeaway a lot of people had was like, what was the point of this? If you're not going to, if you're just going to put together a word salad and basically try and, and somebody else pointed this out, like the harder you try and force control the narrative like this, the harder people are going to push on it and the harder people are going to dig. Yeah. Um, GH says, is it dangerous that the players held more power than the coach? It seems that way. And yeah, I think in this case, it's absolutely dangerous because nobody's got any kind of Latanzio was there from the beginning. Emilio, he was hired to be part of Ramirez's staff. He was hired by the club. Um, typically it's like Dario Sala here when he joined Tata's staff, uh, it was like Rob Valentino being part of Frank DeBoer's staff. Generally you'll have somebody that is separate from the group in case of these kinds of things. So, um, 
waste of time yesterday, it seems like. You're going to get more stuff coming out. I do think it's dangerous that the players seemingly have more power than the coach because the players have no continuity, staying power, clout in Charlotte. They've been there for the same amount of time as the coach has. Um, and I don't think any of those players walk in with any kind of clout to be able to make those kinds of demands. Um, and frankly, I don't think any of them have performed at the level to even get close to any kind of clout to make those demands. Um, none of them have. Uh, Josviak just got there. I'd be shocked if it was him. Alcivar's been solid. Um, Swiderski had a good run, and he hasn't really produced a whole lot since. And if that's the guy, then you're choosing a, a young player to back if that's the guy who had this clout and was the one of the three who was able to at least have an influence on the coaching change. You're back in a young player who hasn't shown all that much over a manager who has won the Copa Sudamericana, which is more than Carol Swiderski has done in his career. Which is very strange. Very, very Carol, strange. Carol Swiderski has very similar numbers to Ronaldo Cisneros. I mean, that's and both of them both went off in really two or three games. And otherwise, it's it's been like not to say performances haven't been bad, but like the goals and assists they drive perception haven't been there. Like, yep. You go back to go back to the beginning as this team's being built, and we we've talked about this about Zorn Cornetta. It feels like the team's been built in two very different ways. You have the South American players that have some version of either experience with or understanding of what Ramirez wanted to accomplish. You have some of the guys from within the league, but then you have a group of European players who probably had no idea what kind of coaching Ramirez would bring, no idea what kind of training sessions he would provide. And, you know, think back to some of the things that uh, Michael Parker has talked with us about, about adjusting to playing for Tata and what the training sessions were like and how different it was than the experiences that he had had. You've got a number of players who would not have had the experience with a manager like Ramirez, who I know he's Spanish, but coming from South America and even in, in Spain, you're going to have a very different mentality than Christian Fuchs probably dealt with at Leicester, then Swiderski dealt with at Pauk, um, then Josviak dealt with at Derby. Uh, you're going to have some differences. So Boshinsky, uh, we haven't even really seen him. Um, it's just a weird situation all the way around. It doesn't look good. They didn't make it look any better yesterday at all. I think they only invited more questions about yeah. why it doesn't look good. It didn't accomplish anything. And now there's going to be time for more rumblings to come out. Um, I have not seen or heard anything alluded to from Ramirez's camp about it. Um, you did have some speculation from uh, a Spanish language reporter in Charlotte that the players were being told not to comment on Ramirez on their social media, not to say anything about him. Um, that's, surprising if that has come out but again when you start to get black helicopter on it because that's all you're left with in the situation and try to figure out okay well which group is this and which group is on the we don't like Ramirez side and which group is not on that side and who do we want to be quiet and who do we not want to be quiet you know like you can start to draw some lines and and figure out that maybe there are a group of players who did not understand Ramirez's mentality who never got it didn't like it and now have at least had some sway in a coaching change from a, again, a coach who's done well. I can't, the, the comment that was, it came out yesterday. I wish I had seen it during the show because my head probably would have exploded and I'm sure it would have made for a lot of entertainment for some of you guys out there. Um, basically the club told a, a local sports reporter that, Yes, they feel like they overachieved, but they feel like they underachieved in their overachieving Wait, with what? Ramirez. Yes. I'm sorry, what? Th yes. That so we we overachieved. They but agreed we that they overachieved, but they okay. thought they could have been even better, yeah. which makes no sense if you overachieved. 
you so know you, what I mean? So they have an over overachieved. That's but yeah. That's again. It's just it's, it's just word salad. Yeah. being thrown out left and right by it, and yeah, they the, the just look if you if you felt like hey we felt like we had to make this change because it wasn't tenable and we think we are doing the right thing for our organization with, you know, long-term success, then just say it. I mean, don't like, just say that and call it a day. Like don't, don't call don't, don't do like a, a press thing where you're going to get out there and just, and just, you're you'll create like circles for 15 minutes. Yeah. Don't, don't just create chaotic, like, well, we don't want to speculate M- my brother in Christ. You, you're the one that did this. Mm-hmm. Like, I, it, it just it, it it felt almost like a gaslighting exercise. And it, it wasn't, and, and the worst thing about it is, it's like it's not like you got stopped outside the building, and someone like someone caught you in an alley and got and tried to get you on the record. You called this and you structured this. Like, if you got if you got ambushed and this can, and this happened, sure, that's more understandable. But this was structured. You could plan for this. You had you had you had planning for this. I, I would think. I mean, because I mean, no, was, you had plenty. It might not be good planning, but you had planning for this. No, no. I, I well, you you had time to plan. Did you That's actually fair. plan? Is is the question? And it was also asked if if they had beaten Seattle, would they have still done it? And, and he said, yeah. He said it wasn't about results. So that would have been amazing because wow. I don't. I don't know the last time an expansion team went and won a game in Seattle. I'd have to, that's, that's a deep lookup. I'm not about to do, no. but to go to Seattle late at night and win a game and then fire your manager would be an outstanding, an outstanding uh, test in, in optics. Yeah, it would have been shocking. Um, I look, I, I don't know. Um, I don't get it. I don't think anybody's going to, the question now, and ultimately, and this is the one thing I really wish if Cornetta didn't want to get into why, because it's hard to explain, because obviously it's going to be hard to make it make sense. Um, all right, fine. You don't want to open that door. That's cool. The The one thing I think he did have to say, and he didn't, and I, I think it's going to be true regardless, is he put his job on the line here. Because how do you spin it if you make this move and it goes badly and you you do worse than you were doing under Ramirez? How can you say that it was the right move then? You know what I mean? Like he's put his job on the line and if he feels so strongly about it with five wins in their first 14, with and he he won't admit it because he did it a bad roster to begin with um if they get worse it's got to be on him yeah absolutely and if he's going to make this bold of a move he's got to come out and say that in my opinion but he didn't so i mean i think regardless it is on him and if they go down the the mountain here and and rolling and falling down and hitting their head on every tree they possibly can um you got to look back at this and say well then why and and that's basically where they are right now um now there were uh tom bogart shared that uh source at another mls club said that ramirez wouldn't last long after his we're blanked quote came out um yeah that ended up proving to be correct but probably not for the reason that they thought it would be um Ramirez also made the comment recently when the salaries came out about uh Charlotte being next to last in terms of salary outlay said I'm not Harry Potter I don't do magic um he had been doing magic uh Bogart also said sources expressed it exclusive wasn't exclusively on field related and recognized decision would be unpopular underlining their steadfast belief in making this coaching change and okay if if that is what the club felt, they were were steadfast in making this change. They knew it would be unpopular. They didn't sell that in their media availability. And that's the failure that they've had here. 
because when you're going to make, and John, you've seen this play out many times over the years. If you're going to make an unpopular decision and you know it, and you know it's not easily explainable because of what the public sees, you've got to sell it. Yep. Especially when you're a new team in their first year. And and Zorn Cornetta did not sell anything yesterday. If you're going to do something that is going to anger, I was about to use another term. If you do something that's going to anger a lot of folks, the first thing you've got to do, and I feel like this is press conference 101 for, for executives, you have to explain in your opening statement why you did something. You can't push it. You can't kick the can down the press conference. You can't sit there and say, I don't want to speculate and, and have your only indicator of why you did something be as at the end of the day, we had no choice. We had to do it. Okay. So you don't want to speculate, but you say that sentence. You open that door, but you don't want to address it. Press Conference 101, if you do something unpopular, you've got to lay it all out. This is why, this is why, this is why, this is why. You've got to win the press conference in an unpopular move. Zoran Kernetta did not win the virtual press conference with anything that he did in basically just deferring and not volunteering any piece of information here. And you risk that door being opened because you didn't volunteer information. And, and, you know, if you take what John Hayes said as a part of the, the information that Zoran Cornetta did not volunteer, you're, mm, you're really putting your job on the line because you're siding with player, possibly players. If you take the John Hayes information, you're siding with player not with the guy that was brought in to be the coach of players and overachieve in your underachieving. Zoran Kernetta failed in press conference 101 yesterday with what he should have explained, but came nowhere close to explaining. It's baffling, and we didn't get any real information added to anything, so we just have to wait and see. Um, it's just a, a, a mess, and we'll have to wait and see. Um, VM Jess, Jessica Charman has nothing to to do with any of this, um, and she doesn't know anything more than than what's out there. So I mean, it's not her role. Um, just like as Cassie pointed out, when it when this has happened in these situations, and I think you've gotten a much better explanation, by the way, even if you didn't like it or you liked it or whatever, and you didn't want to give credit to who was giving you the explanation. I thought the coaching changes when they were of this ilk in Atlanta and it was Frank DeBoer and it was Gabriel Heinze, you got more accountability given and you didn't get that here. And we'll see what the long-term reaction is in the long term. So uh, Jess and Will are doing crowns corner tonight at six o'clock where I think they'll be able to, to dig into things a little bit more um, as to what they know at this point, because I think this caught, pretty much everybody by surprise. The timing of it definitely caught people by surprise uh, because there had not been one rumor about it publicly that I had seen at all. Um, the timing in terms of giving Latanzio a week when they when they all get back from their vacations uh, or most of a week or a little bit more than a week, I don't know what their timeline is. That part's good, and I get that. But, yeah, I'm with Jared. If they had beaten Seattle, then, oh, boy, that would have been a mess. Um, okay. Let's get into some other stuff on the board and one other MLS related one. Uh, Giorgio Chiellini is joining LAFC. That will be announced in the coming days. He's playing his last game for Italy today in the finalissima. Um, Sky Italia had it. A bunch of other people have had it since. Um, he's supposed to head to LA at the end of June. He can't play for the team until july 7th he can train with them before that so you know he's coming off of a season he'll take a break and then go to la uh i'm very confused as to how this is going to work just because of what we've seen from chiellini and what we know about his game one of the best and I, Nick Alifi won't say it, but I'll, I'll say it. One of the best. Uh, he, he's been a, a great 
defender for Italy. He's been a great defender for Juventus, but he is no spring chicken. And this league is very fast. We've had this conversation in Charlotte about Christian Fuchs. This is going to be more of a glaring issue, in my opinion, with Chiellini and LAFC because they are even more risky in the way that they play. And if he is a center back playing on a high line in this form in Major League Soccer in the summer in the United States and Canada, that could get really difficult uh, for him, Jared. Yeah, I'm just... I, all I can think about, and I mentioned it last night, all I can think about is the idea of what happened with Atlanta and Columbus where like LAFC turns the ball over of the field and someone has a fast striker and they just start hitting home run balls and basically saying, hey, Giorgio, go win these one-on-ones when it's 90 degrees in the middle of the afternoon in Los Angeles and just keep doing it over and over again. Just just keep winning these one-on-ones. Go ahead, do it, do it. Step, step, step to the line. How's that offside track going, bud? Man, it's like because if, if you if you're using him to to kind of marshal and organize that back line and you give him some cover, cool. But I don't love the idea of leaving him as like the last guy back you're at not. this point in his career. Well, you can. not last man back, but it's it's not like that. It's not it's not old school. Um, and I mean you can marshal whatever you want to marshal, but if teams are pumping balls over your head, uh your marshalling is not gonna really do anything. And, and LAFC is not going to change their style of play for Chiellini. If they do, that would be very strange um, because I don't think he's the one that's going to have the most impact in that team to base their style of play around. So why would you do that for a, a defender, a center back in the situation who it's, it's just weird. Um, Mamadou Fall, Sebastian Ibiaga have played a lot of center back. Ilias played a little bit, a bit of center back. Now they have kind of played around a bit, with some three center back setups. I feel like if you're going to play Chiellini, that would be the way you'd have to go. Um, I, I'm assuming that if you take their lineup against San Jose, where they played Mama Dufal, Ilié, and Ibiaga as center backs, and Ilié did play really deep, so it's not the, the case of a central midfielder dropping. They played Janela, Sifuentes, and Blessing in front. Kellen Acosta was a wing back on the right. It's not his best position, but when you have a million different central midfielders, then you do something with it. Okay. Hollingshead on the left is a very good wing back in this league. One of the best. I think that might be the way you go is three center backs, three central midfielders, two wing backs and two up top. And if that's their best way to play and they think Chiellini will be better for them than Ibiaga, who would be the one who'd be replaced, you, you got to play fall because you need somebody with a little bit of pace on that back line. Okay. Um, incredibly talented, understands the game as well as, as anybody you're going to find. But just does he have the legs at this point? I'm not so sure that he does. And this signing is very different than what we've seen from LAFC in general. Yeah, Burns says it's safe to say this is a marketing move, not a Chirundolo request. See, but this is the thing, Burn. If this is a marketing move, then it's an even dumber move. And I, I've, I bring this up all the time. And I, I think in, in the soccer world, we can look at that and say, oh, wow, Chiellini is a great player. And this is, you know, it's going to be a big thing. Your average soccer fan or your average sports fan, your average soccer fan who's maybe going to these games, especially in L.A., where you're your average fan might be more around Liga MX, more around what's going on South rather than in Europe. I don't think this does anything from a marketing perspective. I really don't. I, I That's why it's even more crazy to me. So, I mean, if they went, I, I'll, I'll give you the one that was a, a marketing move at the time, but actually made sense when Chivas USA launched and had Claudio Suarez as a center back. Okay, he's one of the most legendary center backs you could find from Mexico in Los Angeles launching a Chivas USA brand. Got it. What can he give you on the field? Yeah, some. But what can he give you in terms of being a face of the team? Everything. That one I get. Chiellini is that? I I don't even think it's that. That's that's why I'm even more confused. 
if it was a if they signed it's not the same position but the the equivalent if they signed Andre Guardado to LAFC okay I'd wonder where he fits I'd wonder how everything works I'd wonder if he could keep up but I would understand the marketing aspect of it this one I don't get um it, it's it's going to be asking a lot and if they can cover for him and if they're going to go to three center backs which they've been doing a little bit here this, that's not new and it wasn't just the san jose game if that's where they're headed oh okay then that's how they're going to cover for him and that's how they're going to make it work and if they feel like that's the best way to play then welcome to lafc in 2022 and also we don't really know where steve Chirondolo is on these things just yet so i'm i'm not gonna go completely that you know he he's the the perfect soccer guy either you know, like we, we got to wait and see a little bit. He's done very well, but this move doesn't make sense from any account to me, the marketing side included. I don't get it. I'm staring at the, the schedule for LAFC and you've got two home matches in Los Angeles in late June within a couple of days of each other, 26 and the 29th. Then you have one, you've got a home match. You have two home matches in July with trips to Nashville and Kansas City. In August, you have a trip to uh, Rio Tinto. You've got two home matches. Then you go to San Jose. You go to Q2 in Austin in late August. Yippee. And then you got Houston as well. That Texas run, wow! I mean, but you didn't make it because of the schedule either. You, you didn't. You're not going to make a signing. You're not going to make a signing like this and say, "Ooh, wait a minute, we have to go to Texas twice." No, we're not going to make the signing. Like, no, it's they made the decision, and it's been going on for a minute that they've talked about it. It's a very different approach. Does he put them over the top? If he doesn't, then I think it's ultimately a bad signing. If he does, then they got it right. And I got it wrong and, and others got it wrong. Um, we'll see. We'll see. I'm shocked that I didn't, when that rumor first came up, I didn't think it was real. Uh, Adam Buxa going to Lens in France, 6 million euro, uh, third most expensive departure in the Revs history. They've already posted some pictures with him with a Lens shirt, although neither club has confirmed things up to this point. Um, kind of knew this was coming. Not a surprise. And, the question for New England is you lose Buxa, you're losing Turner. You lost Buchanan last year, although I, I think they were in the process of kind of shifting the way the team played a little bit to cover for that, even if it hasn't worked. New England has not been able to really get going this year, Jarrett. They've scored goals. Um, they're not bad, but they haven't been able to replicate what they did last year. And now they're going to lose two key figures in the summer from what last year's team was. And I don't know if they're going to be able to recreate that. And, and, and the thing about it for me is like, I, I never expected them to replicate last year because it was the best regular season we've seen. Yeah, I uh, thought it'd be better than four five and four though. Yes. Uh, I didn't expect them to replicate what they'd done, but I expected it to be better than this, especially with books of doing, if you had told me, Hey, New England is going to come back after last year's performance. And Adam Buxa is going to go on a goal scoring tear <clears throat> to start the 2022 season. You could have told me that. And, and then if you said, what's the record going to be? I would not have said what they have now. I've said, oh, they're going to be fine because they're going to, while they are adjusting defensively, they're going to be scoring more than enough goals in that case to handle it. But that hasn't been the case. And the defense has been pretty bad and, now the question and good for Buxa for what it's worth. Like, yeah, because this is a guy who like about this time last year, we were talking about, you know, Hey, can he be that guy? Because can he bet on himself, have a great year and get that move? And now he has, he bet on himself. He was great last year. He's even better this year, in my opinion. And he's gotten that move to Europe. How does new England, uh, how does new England put this back together? How, how do they go? How do they, where do they go to get, to get, on number nine to be that guy who finishes off all the creativity they have around it. Yeah. We'll have to see if Josie Altador is that, I mean, that's one reason why you brought in Josie Altador. Can he be some of that? Um, Georgie Petrovich and goal. Can he give you what you're losing with Turner who gave you a ton last year? And, you know, Turner's injury early in the season was probably a factor in why they're four, five and four. 
Yeah, I don't know if he can give you what Turner gave you, and that's not an insult to him. Yeah, it's we didn't know what Kalina that... would be either, though. So I mean, I, I gotta, I gotta give that is that oh, yeah. you know, I didn't think Kalina would do what he's doing. He has, he's been what Turner was last year. Can Petrovic yeah. from Serbia possibly? We'll find Maybe. out. Maybe it's it's just it's 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 a, it's just such a tough ass because Turner's yep. such an un, an elite shot stopper. Yep. And that's you know, and to to the points today, uh, Jason, about you know the RV, the quote that came about him talking about Arsenal and the New England. Like, yeah, dude, you're not going to be asked to to be super smooth on the ball, breaking out of pressure all the time. Just stop shots. As, as Jared's process. turning, t- Jared's turning into a robot. Um, I'll try to translate robot speak. Um, there was a quote that came out today about Turner talking. One of the the things he wanted to go to Arsenal was to work with the ball at his feet more. Um, that's not something that Bruce Arena asked him to do. It's not something that they do in New England. It's kind of old school. It's it's you know we don't want the ball at your feet for very long. And at Arsenal, you're going to have to do that. National team, you have to do that. And he said when he trained with the national team in the off season, it really helped him. He was doing it consistently. Then when he goes back to New England and he's not doing it, it hurts him. It hurts with the national team. This is a move that. While the playing time is a big question on the national team side, the way of playing is a big help on the national team side. We'll have to see. Uh, Bam is an LAFC fan from Australia in the chat and says that the Chiellini move is a great move. Um, Backline, they struggled in that area. Signing will help with experience. Great to teach Mamadou Fall. I, I agree with that part. I just don't know if he's got enough legs to deal with the way that the game is in MLS. I don't think that he does. The experience will be big. I agree that it's not a designated player. And and yeah, that part, if he had been a designated player, you couldn't do it. There, there'd be no way. As a TAM guy, if you have the money to spend, and again, if you think he's going to put you over the top to win MLS Cup, then you go do it. I just don't think the style of play is going to suit him. And I don't think you're going to get the best out of him. But we'll find out. It's a It's a gamble, in my opinion, from LAFC. And we will find out. Uh, what happens with them. It's also a little bit of, I thought Monorio would end up being the regular there. And I, I don't know what injuries he's had this year and how much injuries he's had, but he has not been the regular. Uh, Ibiaga has played a lot more than I would have expected. Um, three center backs. I have more hope for Chiellini working out, but I still wonder, especially if Ilya is one of those center backs, because then that's two slower guys. That's going to be asking Fall to do a lot of running. But we'll find out. We'll see where that goes. Uh, one other on the MLS front, uh, Rubio Rubin is reportedly in the crosshairs of Atletico San Luis in Liga MX. Loan with a purchase option. That offer should come soon. He just made the one-time switch to represent Guatemala internationally. Eight goals, five assists for RSL last season. Could be a nice little piece of business for RSL because Rubin was a guy that really wasn't looking like he'd end up being at this level again. Um, I think he was at San Diego loyal goes to RSL does well. And now he could parlay that into a Liga MX move and he wasn't going to break through into the, the U S national team. So he can play for Guatemala and represent them. Um, we'll see how RSL spends it, how it goes, but yeah, Rubin potentially, to Atletico San Luis. Uh, U.S. men's national team today. We know the lineup. It'll be Turner, Cannon, Zimmerman, Long, Anthony Robinson, Adams, Musa, Aronson, Aronson Central, Polisic, Weya, and Jesus Ferreira. Uh, Turner getting the start and goal over Sean Johnson, over Ethan Horvath. Aaron Long starting next to Zimmerman as the Miles Robinson replacement. Aronson centrally, first time since the World Cup qualifying opener. McKinney will start to build his minutes back up. He's looking at about 20 in this match. And Malik Tillman is available. Um, His change of association has been approved by FIFA from Germany to the U.S. On the flip side, Morocco, 17 players who were born abroad from Morocco. Five in France, four in the Netherlands. Uh, three in Belgium, three in Spain, one in Canada, one in Germany. Um, Jarrett, what are you looking for in this match against Morocco tonight at 7.30 on Two Day NA and Fox FS1? Wow, nice delivery. Um, no, sorry, it's ESPN. Sorry, I'm, I'm mixing it all up. It's ESPN. Wow, it's ESPN at 7.30. I am deceived. 
Yeah, that's what I try to do. Don't go to Fox. Go to ESPN. <laughs> well, I'll probably be at the Twos game. So see, if you see more than then go to the other channel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, what I'm looking for is just you know, develop some chemistry on that back line. I want to. Like, this is this should be audition time. Like, who wants to who wants to play center back next to uh, next to Zimmerman? Um, Long, here's your shot. Somebody else is surely going to get a shot. I know there have been the reports about John Brooks about you know there being you know issues and feelings and all that so i mean hey one on, people... one on john brooks really quick uh, according yeah. to reports in france marseille are interested in signing john brooks good for him maybe he needs a fresh start just to kind of like hit a hard reset um yeah but i see there's an open audition on that front go create and go have fun playing i mean if you're a player, don't pick up your phone. Don't look at the bird app, man. But um, just no, just go, just go have fun and go 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 play and build some confidence because now this should be a time to ramp up, build confidence. Guys are jockeying for positions to see, you know, not just who's going to start, who's going to make that bench. Like you brought in a couple guys who might be able to come out on the outside lane and make a run on turn four. So I want to see who grabs what with what time they're given, and I, I look forward to seeing. Not just right now, but even next week. What are the reports out of camp? Who's impressing? Who's disappointing? Who needs to do better? That sort of thing. What about you, John? What are you looking for tonight with the national team? I'm right there with Jared. I'm looking at the back, obviously. And I want to see what uh, chemistry builds with Aaron Long and Walker Zimmerman. And I'm also looking in that. I want to see what uh, what Matt Turner is up to. And obviously with what we've been talking about with the article from uh, The Athletic, uh, those are the the two for me, the the two positions that I'm looking at, you know, and then obviously there's the the Malik Tillman aspect of it as well. But I'm obviously, you know, he gets a run in here, but I'm looking at that more over the space of camp more than anything else, just to, to see the new faces and how they start to integrate too. No, I'm definitely looking at Tillman when he gets time. Um, two other players to keep an eye on. They might not start this one, but they might start against Uruguay or in the Nations League games that follow. Haji Wright. Talked about him a little bit with Dylan Butler yesterday. Uh, 14 Super League goals for Antalya Spor in the Turkish Super League. Nine in his last 10. He was a U.S. Youth International in the U.S. Uh, U-17 cycle that had Pulisic, Luca De La Torre, Tyler Adams. Um, Pulisic said that was the duo back in the day, me and Haji. Uh, we played a lot of games together in the youth national teams, and it's cool to have him back in. First of all, seeing him do so well at club level and having him in here is great. Another one to keep an eye on is Joe Scally, 19 years old. bunch of people were like, play Scally, play Scally, play Scally. He he started all 17 games for Mönchengladbach in the first half of the season. Only three starts after that, but 30 appearances in his first full year. He was called in the November qualifying window, didn't play against Mexico or Jamaica. He can play both sides as an outside back. I think that's going to help him, but he's going to have to perform when he gets the opportunity in these games. Um, Morocco and Uruguay will provide a much different test than the Nations League games. I think for me in general, I'm looking at the number nine position. Tonight, I'll be looking at Jesus Ferreira uh, to see if he can start to put his marker down for that spot because Haji Wright's right there. Uh, there's plenty of other guys that if you got to go a little bit deeper into it, you will. Um, there's not a lot of time to do it, but out of the group that is called in and maybe a few on the fringes, nobody has made that spot their own just yet. Can Jesus Ferreira do it? I think he can. I think he's the best fit, but he's got to play like it. Um, Scally has a huge opportunity. Aaron Long, huge opportunity. I, I think Burhalter would like for that player next to Zimmerman to be long. Long's got to show that he is that player. Um, we'll get a read on it after the game today. Morocco's a good team. They'll get tested. Um, the game against Uruguay will be very different, and I think the offense will have some different kinds of tests in that one as Uruguay will, will likely be a little more defend and counter. So these two games, we'll learn a good bit before we get to next week. We get into those Nations League games where in a perfect world, you've made a decision based off these two friendlies and you go with the best team you have in those two Nations League games and, and hopefully blow somebody out. But hopefully you've, you've gotten to that point by these first two. Jarrett, you're going to rejoin us in hour number two. That's the game plan. That is the game plan. If it's I'm, I'm... not, 
if it doesn't come out that way, because, okay. hey, game plans change sometimes, they do. then you are going to be possibly at the twos match this evening, and you are going to be in charge of the twos review afterwards, correct? Yes. I- I'm not, like, assigning that to you. That was actually already re- <laughs> That's already that. assigned. Yeah, um, that I'm also going to be emotionally crippling myself with uh, Scotland and Ukraine today. Well, how's that going to go? Make a prediction. Um. Oh, he's thinking too hard. I'm afraid. <laughs> Why are you afraid? <laughs> um, because it's it's one of those things that's hard to quantify. The emotional boost that comes with Ukraine playing in this game in this moment in their history. Yeah. Um. Normally, I would feel pretty good about Scotland. <laughs> It just this kind of feels like one of those moments that you write stories about where a country is going to rally a country and a team are going to rally behind each other and do not really want anything to do with Ukraine right now because I'm worried that they're going to be absolutely, um, you know, flying high with the emotion and trying to do this for for their people who have just been in hell for the last few months. That game is at 2.45. Um, that's another ESPN one, correct? Uh, yeah, I believe it's ESPN+. Plus. Okay. I, I, I don't know if it's on the, if it's on the mother, one of the mothership networks. I think networks. it is. I think it is over the air. Um, I think it's both. Yeah. Um, I, I will be, I, anyone else in the world, I feel like Scotland would have plenty of people behind them. Um, I don't blame anyone for pulling for Ukraine in this game, though, because it would be a hell of a story. Yeah, this is going to be a very, very interesting one. Uh, maybe if you rejoin us, we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the show. Yeah, we'll see. All right, y'all we'll take see. care. Bye. Bye. All right, quickly, John, tell us about our good friends over at Eliminize. I can certainly do that. QR code over my left shoulder for those of you watching on Twitch. Apologize for the current glare. For odor free, clean, fresh air, one place you need to go with Eliminize service, deodorizing in closed spaces like houses, apartments, and condos. Eliminize has created a customized solution that eliminizes all organic odors, including those like pet cigarettes and food. Realtors and property managers use Eliminize service to eliminize bad odors to help them sell or rent those homes that much faster. The turnkey process makes it easy to work with realtors and property managers. Kind of the environment. We like that these days. A very green way of going about things to get rid of odors without any kind of toxic residue whatsoever. Different than our favorite masking agents that we have under the sink. Because when we take out that masking agent from underneath the said sink and spray it in the air, that's why they call it a masking agent. That's what you're doing. You're masking the odor. You're not attacking the problem all the way down to the molecule like Eliminize Service does with their proven scientific formula. Pricing very, very easy, either by parts per million or cubic feet to come up with a price that's affordable for you. Offering results in 24 hours or less. If you have any questions frequently asked or otherwise, go to their website, Eliminize.com. But do us a favor as well. After the .com goes slash Atlanta, so they know what part of the world that you are reaching out to them from to end a sentence and a preposition. So your full homework assignment, E-L-I-M-I-N-I-Z-E dot com slash Atlanta, Eliminize dot com slash Atlanta for odor free, clean, fresh air on a wall pass Wednesday. Eliminai service proud sponsors of everything. SDH. Mike Conti joining the show. How's it going, Mike? Hey, guys. Good morning. How are you? Good, good. good. What about you? Good. Very good. Uh, MLS stuff all over the place right now. Uh, Miguel Angel Ramirez, I thought it was a troll account that he was fired yesterday when it was posted. Found out that it wasn't. Um, Didn't learn anything additional in the press conference. How surprised were you? Uh, Shocked. Makes no sense. Uh, the rumors that I'm hearing as to why it happened frustrate me. Um, I I think they're rumors that are kind of out there in the wind. So I don't know if I have to be too terribly delicate, um, in, in trying to, you know, I don't know, I guess protect, uh, you know, where the rumors are coming from. Um, it it sounds like, sounds like he lost his dressing room. Um, part of it anyway. Yeah, I, that's, I that's the part that's like, weird. Yeah, um, or yeah, one one part of the dressing room. Um, I don't know. I just I feel like we see this a lot now, and it it's uh, maybe it's a sign that this is becoming a player driven league, uh, and that you know players kind of 
have the keys. But, you know, this is another instance relatively recently of an example where, I mean, if the rumors are true, a coach was sacked because uh, players didn't want to play for him anymore. And um, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I kind of feel like the players have to be held a little bit accountable for that as well. Um, you know, it, and every situation is different. You know, it, for example, with Gabriel Heinze, I think we learned some things after the fact that put into context yeah. why certain players did not want to play for him. And maybe we'll get that information. Uh, but if this is just a matter of one of your designated players not wanting to play for the coach for, you know, specious reasons, I, I don't like this. And I, I think it, Charlotte may have sacked a, a really, really good coach as a result. But again, we have to wait for more to come out. Uh, you know, my my initial reaction when Ernan Lasada was sacked was, well, why they do that? Well, then we learned a little bit more, and, and it became a little more understandable. Uh, the rhetoric that was coming out of Zoran Cronetta's press conference yesterday was cryptic, and yeah. that, that does not help. <laughs> that no. does not help no. to d- dispel any uh, narratives or anything like that. Miguel Angel Ramirez was a good coach. Um did he do something wrong that prompted at least one of his players to not want to play for him anymore? I think that's what we need to find out. Uh, you know, the thing is, if you if you compare it to Lasada to Heinze, um, there's a little bit of a bigger conversation going on right now that we can get into here in a second. But the difference between those two and Ramirez is. Ramirez had the least amount of expectations and got the best results of, of either one of those guys. Um, oh, not even close. So like, that's the hard thing. And I said this with, with Heinze, if Heinze, you know, was challenging guys and, and making it uncomfortable for some guys, but he was getting results, then we're having a very different conversation. Now, some of the other things with relationships at the club might have still made it a deal that needed to be made. That hasn't come out here yet. And it's almost like Carnetta and what he said was to open the door for some of those things to come out. And I feel like you're going to see, you're going to see some targeted things come out, but if it's just purely, a, some players or a group of players or, or one designated player, you know, didn't want to play for him anymore. I don't think there's anybody on that team with maybe the exception of Christian Fuchs. And, and in this league, I don't think he has it, but in general, you could say that he has it. I don't think any of them have the clout. To, Me, I, I, I cannot agree with you more. That's and, the one that I don't get. Yeah. I cannot agree with you more. And the, the rumored player, that might yeah. be at the heart of this. Yeah, we've, we've talked about uh, it. It's Swiderski that everybody Swiderski. Has, has zeroed in on. You're not Lewandowski, okay? You're Swiderski. No. You're yeah. playing in MLS. You haven't really accomplished a whole lot yet in this league. You don't have the clout or the leverage to get your manager sacked uh, if this is purely just a football thing. Now, yeah. again, it there could be way more going on that we don't <laughs> know about. Um. But if it's just a matter of a football issue or a football disagreement, no. I don't think Carol Swiderski has the the clout to be able to go into the sporting director's office or the 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 owner's office and say, I want this guy out of here. So I'll be really, really curious to see what follow-up reporting, what subsequent reporting comes out about this because I really do think there's got to be more to this story. On the surface, what's kind of out there in the wind doesn't add up uh, to this conclusion. But what you've done in Charlotte is set a dangerous precedent with player going to technical director, going, I don't want to play. Once again, this is just referencing the John Hayes stuff from The Athletic. And it's either me, meaning Swiderski, allegedly, or coach. And the technical director sides with player who doesn't have a whole lot of clout during his time in Major League Soccer. And I think it sets a dangerous precedent going forward for this club where Kernetta has 
allegedly, apparently, sided with player, regardless of the coach that comes in, as long as Swiderski, apparently, is a part of this roster for anything going forward. If Swiderski or anyone who is in line with him says, oh, I don't like what's going on, then Cornetta has, with precedent being set, has a path that he's already gone down and probably would end up going down again. This is a dangerous precedent for this club, Mike. It certainly doesn't make it easy to fill the vacancy for them. Um, and it, it sounds like the the one assistant that they retained is is probably going to have this job for the rest of the year. He is. Uh, or, or at least for the foreseeable future. So, the rest I mean, of the he, year is what they've said so far. So he's going to have a nice little audition. But, yeah, yeah I mean um, – you know, clubs that fire managers on hair triggers tend to find it difficult to find new managers. Again, though, I, I think let's let's hold on just a little bit to see if something else comes out. Um, and, and, John, the other thing I would say is I think that precedent has already been set with other clubs in the league uh, and other clubs in the world, by the way. I mean, th- this is absolutely not the first time where a player or a group of players – uh, if these rumors yeah. are true, uh, where a player or a group of players has successfully lobbied to have their manager sacked, happens but this is in all a, over the world. True, it does. But this is in an expansion club in year one that hasn't even reached the halfway point of their season. They decide that, OK, managers got to go after you've overachieved. But apparently, yeah. according to some folks in Charlotte, you've underachieved and you're overachieving. Uh, you're, let's say 14 matches in in a schedule that you're not at the halfway point on a first year club. I think that's what to me sets this one a little apart. Uh, no, I, I'm with you, I, I, and that's why again I, I feel like there's got to be more to this. Um, if there's not, everything you're saying is 100 percent correct. I think what's weird is, and it goes back to kind of a bigger topic, and it's come up, you know, in in our work here in Atlanta. Honestly, I. Th- I, I think in a reverse situation a little bit, uh, it's come up with other other clubs. You have a very different way of, of working in a Latin style coach and a European style coach. And, and we see this at clubs in Europe. We, we've had the conversation come up about somebody like Marcelo Gajardo. And if he goes to Europe, where would he be a good fit? And would they really have the belief that his style would work and his way of working would work? Tata Martino came in and it was a very different way of working for guys who hadn't been in that environment. Michael Parkhurst has, has talked with us about that. Um, Greg Garza has worked in those kinds of environments. It wasn't as much of a shock for him in the way that Tata worked, but for some it is. We, we've we heard the reverse here a little bit with the, the ways that Frank DeBoer was and not so much his work, but personality, it seems like. The Latin players, not as much of a fan. That's what's wild about this game, and that's the element that I think is is really hard with any hire to get nailed down, is personalities are a big part of it. Styles are so different, and there are very different ways of thinking about everything from a philosophy to tactics to how to train to personality on the field in different parts of the world. And when you have a team like Charlotte that is built with a group of European players and and European players without really much experience in dealing with the Latin side of the game, and you hire a Spanish coach who's worked in South America, there's going to be some butting of heads. There's just no mm-hmm. way around that. Yeah. No, that, that's a really, really good point. Uh, and, you know, even if there is nothing more to come out of this, even if there are no additional details that come out of it, that is a, a fundamental truth. And if you look at the construction of Charlotte's roster, you've got a lot of European players. Um, Some important ones, yeah. yeah. Some very important ones. Uh, well, I mean, it, your best players, your goalkeeper, European. Your yeah. your designated players, Swiderski, European. Um, Two of your DPs are Polish. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, exactly. And then Fuchs, who I think might be the most important player of all on that team, European. Yeah. <laughs> he uh, might be in the locker room in, in terms of cloud. He, he hasn't Influential. been on the field. And and that's, I think that's where I'm at with this. And I am I'm, I'm, was looking back at a couple of things, and we'll talk to Nico Moreno about this a little more tomorrow. Uh, ahead of the game with Seattle, Nico interviewed Guzman Carujo, who has come mm-hmm. in, I think, been very, very good at center back. Yes. He's been 
better than Fuchs uh, yes. on the back line. And Carujo said, you know, about Ramirez, he he breathes and lives the game. He's an incredible person. He was always available to talk to. That's where it feels like there is a little bit of a cultural disconnect here. And, and you've got some players who have not bought in, maybe is the, the generic term to use, to not just style of play, but methods to get there. And you've got some players who have absolutely bought in. And now when you have this kind of a change, how united is this group? We're going to find yeah. out. Yeah, I mean, we are. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, you're making this change now at a point where uh, whatever, you know, differences in style, uh, you're, you're going to have a couple weeks to kind of implement it. But look at their schedule coming out of the international break. Red Bulls. Then you play at Columbus, um, Montreal, Austin, who's been very, very good. Um, you have to go to Houston before the 4th of July, then Nashville. Um, then your schedule lightens up a, a, a teeny bit. But, I mean, you're, you're talking about, uh, you know, six or seven really tough games out of the shoot coming out of the international break. And, oh, by the way, you also have a friendly against Chelsea coming up. Uh, where I think Charlotte's going to try to make a statement uh, to their fans in whatever responsible way they can. Yeah. So if they're hoping to get like a new manager bounce, it's going to have to be one heck of a bounce to navigate that portion of the schedule because there are some tough games in there and some very, very tough road games in there. Um, again, I will be anxious to see if we get something more on this in the next couple days. And if there's any club in the league where I think Jason and I might have a couple advantages when it comes to having sources outside of Atlanta United, it would be this one. So Lord knows I was trying last night. Couldn't get anything. (laughs) Let's try again today. We'll see if I get anything today. If I don't get anything today, I'll try again tomorrow. I think what Uh, I'm surprised by is with Cornetta not saying anything in the press conference. Just Again, I'll I'll hop in the seat of the black helicopter for a second. You would think that if they don't want to say it directly, but the club would like people to know some things, that they would have ways to do that, and it would well, be out there by now. Yes. And yeah, it's yeah. not. I, I would want to share this because I'd mentioned it before, and I finally found the tweet. I've been looking for this all morning. Uh, Will Kunkel, or Kunkel, of uh, Charlotte Sports Live, um, 11 p.m. every night on the Fox affiliate in Charlotte. This is the tweet from him yesterday afternoon, and this was 316, so towards the end of the Zorn Cornetta press conference. Mm -hmm. Will tweeted, I'm told Charlotte FC thinks they have overachieved this season, but also think they have punched above their weight in spite of, not because of, Miguel Angel Ramirez. That's one of the most baffling things I've ever heard. And I'm not, no it's not a shot at Will. It's yeah. that's what he's been told. And I'm like, what? <laughs> then that, what I, have how have they punched above their weight if it's not Ramirez? Right. Yeah. I, there's not an answer to that. Here's that's the why. thing. Like, let's go back to when Heinze got sacked here. Mm-hmm. You know, Darren and Carlos didn't get overly specific, but they did make it pretty clear. Yep. that Heinze was not getting along with everyone at the club, not just players. Yep. They get overly specific and say, yeah, you know, they weren't, he was denying the players water, which by the way, that was a completely overblown narrative, <laughs> completely <laughs> misconstrued yeah. and overblown and misunderstood. But still, you know, they didn't get into super specific, you know, you got information the, you, pointed you, you in the at right the end direction. of that press conference why Gabriel Heinze was no longer the coach of Atlanta United, and it didn't necessarily have to do with direction of travel. Uh, Zoran Cronetta did not, with his comments yesterday, give me a similar impression that there is a clear reason why Miguel Angel Ramirez is no longer the coach, or there's a reason that he knows he can't put out there right. because it's gonna right. look bad that you was know what? where i was it felt yeah, more it, like it, hiding covering 
You know what I mean? If like, that's the case, it puts him in a very, very difficult position because yeah. you have to have the press conference. You have to be accessible. You have to answer to the people who are asking the questions. But it then you'd better hope that it was his decision and his decision alone. Otherwise, I want to hear from the owner. And yeah. He and, said the and, management group, which, I mean, it's him, and it's the president who hasn't been there all that long. Right. And so, of course, I, the president is not going to sit there and probably go against I would what assume. Trinetta is saying. It's like, yeah, okay, I get where you're coming from. You're not going to rock the boat early in yeah. your job. And he said Tepper was looped in. That was those were the the ways that Cornetta explained it yesterday. So well, that was nice of them. Uh, was, yeah, <laughs> he was looped in. The management team looped the owner in on yeah. making one of the most yeah. shocking uh, coaching changes <laughs> in the history of Major League Soccer. He was looped in. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, uh, like, when was the last time? And this might have been in the NBA. Uh, when was the last time that you saw something this rash involving a coach who was successful? yet apparently had player or players go to his boss and go, you know, dude, yeah, I know th- this isn't working. And even though it, it countered what you were seeing in the yeah. witness boss column. It does happen a lot in the NBA. Um, I, I would even point to Frank Vogel with the LA Lakers just very recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Frank Vogel two years ago won a world championship and now he's fired uh, for Darvin Ham. Uh, and you know, you heard rumblings that Russell Westbrook and Frank Vogel were not like completely on the same page. Uh, and you know, obviously you have the specter of LeBron James who can get any coach fired at any time Mm -hmm. that happens all the time in the NBA to good coaches, Frank Vogel, um, David Blatt, who was the head coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers. And and then one day he was fired, you know. Mm -hmm. Doc Rivers kind of got pushed out of the LA Clippers. Doc Rivers is a phenomenal head coach. Um, and then, you know, falling out between Doc Rivers and Ben Simmons almost resulted in Doc Rivers being gone from Philadelphia. So it does happen a lot in the NBA. One difference, though, is in the NBA, you only have 15 players in your locker room. Yeah. It only takes one or two players to go sour for the whole locker room to, to get twisted. And on the court, that one player can define things a whole lot more than they can in, in a soccer match. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and right. in two of those, when it's LeBron James, mm-hmm. LeBron's got the clout. Yeah, right. All right, and, and you know you can not like that or not, whatever. But LeBron has got some things that he can point at that I'm sorry, Carol Swiderski cannot. I, I agree. I mean, again, that's why that that was the aspect of these rumors that really bothered me. Yeah. Now, if you're firing Miguel Angel Ramirez because Carol Swiderski doesn't uh-huh. want to play for him for a football reason, right? If that's what it is, I don't like that. Um, you know, the the play again. I, I don't want to rehash this, but you know, the players have a professional obligation to cooperate to an extent with the way they're being coached. If they don't like the way they're being coached, there are avenues they can take to address it, but quitting or walking off the training ground or something like that is not the professional manner in which to do it. Now, you know, when we heard last year that Joseph Martinez did not want to play for Gabriel Heinze, initially, I had very much the same feelings that I have now. I have a lot of respect for Joseph, very, very important player. I wasn't necessarily thrilled with the idea that Joseph was making that kind of stand until we found out why he was making the stand. And then... The context was totally different. Right. And that's why, and I hate to repeat myself, but I am holding out hope that maybe there is more to this because if there's not, it smells kind of fishy and rotten to me. Yeah. The the one thing I'll say that's different there, and I think we talked about this last year when when it happened with Heinze, the results were not good enough to deal with the other stuff. Also true. Here, yes. in they, my opinion, they are good enough. Yeah, you didn't have they the athletic capital. Yeah, they they are. I I feel like the results and oh. and to the point that when Carnetta says in the media availability that you know if they had beaten Seattle that they still would have made the move. 
Um, if they had beaten Seattle, they would have been around the middle of the pack in points per game when you take all the teams since 2017. I, I, I did math over the, the weekend, and it, it was a little painful, but I did it. And Charlotte is around the middle of the pack already in points per game. There are a number of teams since 2017 that have been worse than what Charlotte's been straight out of the gate. There's never been a manager who had as many wins as Ramirez fired from an expansion team in MLS. That had just not happened. Um, at this stage of a season, the ones who had been fired around this stage of a season as expansion managers had one or two wins through yeah. 10 to, to 15 games, not five. Um, and if he'd gotten six, they still would have fired him, according to Cornetta. So, like, if whatever bumps in the road are there, whatever cultural clashes would are, are there, whatever different mentalities are, are there in the way the team trains or plays or speaks or whatever the issues are, the results have been better than expected. So I, it, it's harder to make the move because of that, in my mind. If the results yeah. weren't there, then sure, I get it. Well, I, I mean, Charlotte, look, I mean, back in January and February, I was saying I thought Charlotte would struggle to win games in USL Championship with the way their roster was constructed going into the season. Yeah, It has been way, way ahead of where I thought they would be. Um, and had they won on Sunday, and that was a winnable match. I mean, they were right there. That yeah. was a winnable match. We were talking about this team being in sixth right now and league. seven points out of first. Uh, your first place team of the game in hand. But, I, I mean, that's that's a lot better than a team that would struggle to win a USL championship. So, the, Ramirez has to have at least part of the credit for that. Yeah. Um, if not full credit. Yeah, look, was I a huge fan of Ramirez's antics in the Atlanta match? Did I like the fact that he jumped all around and celebrated like they won the World Cup? No, I don't like that. But if I were a Charlotte fan, I would have loved it. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And if I were a Charlotte player, I would have loved it. Would have loved the passion. So I, I just I hope we get more context to this because right now it's not adding up. I'm also very curious to see when, uh, whether directly or through others, uh, what Miguel Angel Ramirez has to say yes. about this because – Oh, buddy. Well, and I wonder where he goes next. You know, um, yeah. quite frankly, there are probably some other MLS clubs that might take a pretty hard look at him. Uh, I would. I mean, Minnesota. Hi. Have... <laughs> well, right. Uh, <laughs> they still I mean, have and, to make a move. There is, there is, by the way, precedent for that relatively recently. Wilmer Cabrera getting sacked in Houston yeah. and ending up in Montreal in the same season. Uh, there is absolutely precedent for that to occur. It, it happened as recently as 2019. Um, San Jose, Ahmed, yes, San Jose, great call. I don't think he'd um, go there because of the, the lack. No, nah, because of the lack of resources, I don't think he'd go there. I, I don't think DC or. San Jose, and also from his perspective, I mean, he'd be following – Losada had issues with people, and Losada sounds like he was far more difficult with some aspects of things that are very common in other countries in the way the game's managed. Chris Seitz spoke about this on the call-up. Uh, definitely recommend checking that out with our friend Jillian Sakovitz and Susanna Collins. I mean, Seitz talked about the the – borderline obsession that Lasada had about player weight and, and how much weight they were carrying. And it really affected sites mentally yeah. um, in other countries. That is a more common thing here that has not really been. And for Ramirez, who, if we're, we're kind of connecting dots, if he rubbed people the wrong way in Charlotte, I don't think DC is the job for him to go follow up somebody who rubbed people the wrong way. And in San Jose, the issue that Almeida always had was, getting resources, getting players, getting quality. Ramirez has come out and said multiple times he wasn't happy with the quality he got in Charlotte, so I don't know if that would fly either. Mm. Minnesota, though, yeah. would be one where if he walks in and he's got uh, Reynoso as a guy to play with and, and build around, and he's got a club that will spend some money, um, he, he would obviously do better than an expansion manager who kept their job after doing worse than he did in the first year. Uh, Adrian Heath is still there and he has not progressed that team. In my opinion, he, he progressed them to a Western conference final in the COVID year, but Minnesota in terms of points per game 
over their run of time, right in the middle of the league, and right around the same number that Ramirez posted in Charlotte with a lesser team. I think if they made that move, and Minnesota has shown no ambition to make a bold move like that, because it would be bold if Minnesota came out and said, okay, yes, we are going to hire this man who was just fired, and we're going to fire our manager who's been here from day one. I don't think they have it in them, but I think they would benefit from it if they did. Yeah, but culturally, that club is very, very, very um, patient. Yes, (laughs) Yes, patient. <laughs> yes, very patient, patient. Waiting more than a full year to sign a designated player. Mm-hmm. Patient in waiting multiple years to, you know, re- make a, a decision on a head coach or a deliberate. Right. Yeah, yeah, deliberate. That plotting, very plotting up there in uh, in Minnesota. But no, I'm with you. I mean, again, uh, Charlotte played a style that was very enjoyable to watch, very entertaining under Miguel on Hell Ramirez. The Atlanta Charlotte match here in Atlanta back in March, I think it was March 13th. I think that was the most entertaining Atlanta United match of the year. That's I fun. really do. Uh, it was a good high quality match. Um so you know if if you want to bring in a coach who's going to entertain fans and I, I don't necessarily know if that's a, a concern in Minnesota. They're obviously drawing very well. But um you know, if if you are an owner who is looking for a way to entertain your fans, that's a guy I'd be talking to, hundred yeah. percent. Well, let's save some some good stuff, including reactions to Ronald Hernandez's injury, which we kind of knew was coming when you saw yeah. it. Um, we'll have more to talk about on stoppage time this afternoon. Yes, uh, we certainly will. That'll be at two o'clock today on Twitch and the ninety two nine the game Facebook page. There have been requests for more whiteboards, so maybe yeah. before we get started uh, back with games, maybe uh, we can figure out a way to come back over to the studio and do a big whiteboard situation somehow. The return of Whiteboard Chronicles. Yeah, we'll see what we can come up with, because um, mm-hmm. I, I think what the questions that I've gotten about the way they play and like how the Dijon goal comes up and stuff like that, it's going to be a little more complicated than I can do with my limited uh, digital skills. Yeah. So I'm going to need to use the old school. I mean, I might need a chalkboard for this stuff, so we'll, we'll figure it out, but we'll, we'll come up with a way to do it or I'll come up with a way to do it here. And maybe we'll do that next week, but we'll, we'll talk today about all kinds of stuff uh, involving how we're going to field a team with everybody injured. Yeah, boy, oh boy. I don't think it's quite as bleak as it feels. It, it doesn't feel great yeah. at the moment. I don't think it's quite as bleak as it feels. But yes, we. I I, I won't eat all the profits here. We'll uh, <laughs> we'll discuss UTM on Facebook. Yeah, a little little bleak about fullback position right now. That that might be an issue at the moment. But I, I, you know, I think there's a solution. We'll talk about it at two p.m. Oh, that's cool. what they call a tease in the business. That, that yep. is a tease. We will talk then. Thanks, Mike. All right, see you guys. Be good. All right, let's uh, bring this fella back in because he does show up on time. Mm-hmm. Yes. What's up? It's Jared not much. Wolf. No. No, it's not. I um, actually am not good at playing any of the instruments from Peter and the Wolf, unless it has strings. So, okay, there's that. Other things to get into today because there's lots of stuff on the board. Uh, we'll come back to Scotland and Ukraine and dig a little bit deeper into that uh, UEFA stuff. So, uh, the Hungarian Federation has found a loophole in the UEFA guidelines to have a game in the Nations League. Because remember, Hungary has had all kinds of problems and all kinds of competitions with racist behavior from their fans. Mm -hmm. And they've been ordered to play games without crowds due to the racist behavior of their fans. But somehow they have found a UEFA regulation that allows children to attend accompanied by an adult. So in a game that is supposed to be behind closed doors against England, which is one of the teams that has had to deal with racist behavior from the Hungarian fans, there will be 30,000 people at a behind-closed-doors match. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Also, you've had situations like this where teams have done this and played games 
behind closed doors, but they cited this thing with kids being there. And then there was racist behavior. So I'm shocked. Kids. Yes. Very good. Uh, England, to be fair, is going to do something somewhat similar because England is also uh, going to have to play behind closed doors in a match. They are going to play Italy at Molino on Saturday, June 11th. But 2,000 fans are going to attend as opposed to 30,000 in a behind closed doors game. I don't know, UEFA, if you're going to have a match that's behind closed doors, maybe you just make it behind closed doors. Yeah. It's a crazy idea that, you know, behind closed doors, you can sing the old song if you want to. And there's nothing in the lyric about a loophole with kids and an adult attending. Come on. Ridiculous. Uh, Yeah. Ridiculous. So 30,000 in a behind closed doors game in Hungary. Yeah. Uh, Let's go to Italy on stuff. Uh, Monza. We talked about them on soccer over there. They got the last promotion spot in Serie A. It was a wild second leg at Pisa. uh, 6-4 on aggregate. Extra time needed. Monza goes through. Now there's talk about Mario Balotelli going back to Monza. He was at the celebration party. Um, Obviously knows Berlusconi very, very well. And it is the first ever Serie A appearance for Monza after they were founded in 1912. Berlusconi's former team, Milan, have announced that Redbird has reached a takeover agreement with the current owner's Elliott management. There's still things to be signed and and things to do on the official front, but they've been in talks for weeks. The agreement has been reached on the basis of 1.2 billion euro. Um, Invest Corp looked like they were going to get it done uh, out of Bahrain. They were not able to get it done. Redbird from the United States jumped in and got it done. They have 10% of Fenway Sports Group. Uh, which owns Liverpool. They have 10% of Fenway, not of Liverpool directly. Uh, Elliot will retain a minority financial interest in the club. They'll keep seats on the board of directors. Uh, There will be a partnership between Redbird and Elliot going forward. The takeover in terms of all the legalities and stuff is going to go over the summer, be finalized by September, but they will have money to spend in the summer window. One of the big things that they have to get sorted out quickly, and Jerry Cardinal, the managing partner of Redbird, is in Milan to meet with Paolo Maldini. Maldini, um, huge part of the backroom staff at Milan, uh, amazing work in the transfer market to build a team that won the Scudetto. His contract is up at the end of June, and they got to get that done. He wants to stay. They want him to stay. They just have to get it done um, in terms of what his contract personally will be and what he wants to do in the summer window and what they will budget to do that. Uh, Redbird, in addition to Fenway, they uh, own Toulouse in France. So you're starting to get a little bit of a multi-club situation here. Uh, In Spain, talking about the financial part of clubs, Barcelona, Barcelona, Board meeting today, Barcelona confirmed the news that Sport reported on Sunday in town, an extraordinary assembly, uh, unscheduled meeting, on June 16th to vote on several financial operations that are on the table and reportedly have to be on the table to get some things done this summer, including signing uh, guys out of contract like Christensen and Kessie. The board's going to ask its members. Barcelona is a member-driven club. The board has to ask their members to authorize two things. The sale of up to 49.9% of Barca licensing and merchandising. And number two, the sale of up to 25% of the La Liga television rights that Barcelona gets to one or more companies. Uh, Barcelona have been working on both for a while. They hope to bring in $200 for the first one on the licensing and merchandising. 200 million euro um, probably not going to get done to where the money's in the accounts by June 30th. They need to do something else to get money in the accounts by June 30th to close out the current financial year without losses and increase their spending limit with La Liga because of the way La Liga's cap works. It's very strange, but Barca need to get things done by June 30 to have more money to work with in the upcoming season. So they are also going to do that club TV rights thing. Um, everything's on track for Barcelona to finally join the La Liga CVC deal. 270 million euro loan would be given to the club in exchange for CVC taking 8.2% of the club's La Liga TV rights. So, and it wouldn't count as debt. So you would get 270 for that for 8.2%, then sell another 25% 
to one or more companies, you would keep 30 or you would sell end up 33 and some change. So you'd keep the rest as revenue going forward. And then you're also working on the sale of 49% of Barca Studios, which has already been approved by the membership, but you got to get the sale done. You got to get the money in. Um, you could be in a position where by June 30, you have added six, 700 million euro to your accounts. You're still in debt, but you're going to be in a position to have more cap space to work with in La Liga next season. Uh, but if you're, if you don't, and you don't get these things done, then you're going to potentially have even less cap space than you did last year, which was a huge issue. So yeah, this is kind of a big deal. The vote would be electronic, so it would be quick, and it would just give them some support. It could go up to 740 million euro if the the realistic things that have been talked about get done in time. A um, couple more quickly but before we move on. Uh, Gareth Bale, he gave his thank you to Real Madrid for nine seasons there. We knew he was leaving. He's out of contract. Aston Villa, Cardiff, DC United have been linked. Um, he is with Wales for Nations League games as well as Sunday's World Cup playoff against the winner of Scotland and Ukraine today. Um, quickly from a roundup in CONCACAF uh, of champions and such, uh, Atlas won their second straight Liga MX title, 3-2 on aggregate over Pachuca. Great second leg. If you didn't have a chance to see that, go back and check out the highlights. Uh, Pachuca was the super leader, the regular season champion. Atlas won back to back, and they hadn't won a title since 1950 or so before that. So, just an amazing story of what Atlas has been able to do. In Honduras, Motagua won the title over Real España, 18th league title in their history. Comunicaciones won their first Guatemalan title since 2015. They're 31st of all time, tied with Municipal, who they beat in the final as the most in Guatemalan history. Alianza won in El Salvador. They've won back-to-back. -back. They have 17 titles now. They're one behind FAS. And there's a different Alianza who is the champion in Panama. Um, first time they've ever won it. They're 59 years old and ended up getting it done in the final, which was a one-off one game. Uh, they, they get your win. So a new champion in Panama for the first time and a lot of legendary teams winning in the rest of CONCACAF and Atlas becoming the Campeón de Campeones. So they will be in the Campeones Cup against NYC. There is going to be a game, like they usually have the Campeón de Campeones, but it's not going to determine who goes to the Campeones Cup. So it will be Atlas and NYC in that later this year. Uh, what's going on in England, John? Well, we've got uh, obviously stuff with Nottingham Forest now coming into the Premier League for the first time in almost a quarter century. Uh, they're Big Boss Man uh, has said that, yes. Ray Trailer? Yes, Ray Trailer, exactly. Yes, Ray Trailer, the Big Boss Man himself. You said Big Boss Man? Yeah, the owner, Evangelos Maranakis. Oh, is, that guy. Yeah, that guy. I know. It's not quite the same. He doesn't uh, He doesn't quite have a badge and, uh, and look the part of Ray Trailer. Doesn't He's quite or doesn't? Because that seems like one of those things that would either be one way or another. It's, yeah. No, he doesn't. But uh, Steve Cooper is in line for a new contract and has pledged that he'll provide ammunition, in quotation marks, for a summer spending um, spree. Are, are you just going to leave Maranakis right there? Is you just going to leave that alone? That You don't know anything else about what's going on with uh, Evangelist Maranakis? No, what am I missing? Oh. John, 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 John. Um, the Premier League are going to probe uh, Marinakis, and uh, not in the way you might be thinking, um, <laughs> because they're, I don't know, match fixing and drug trafficking allegations in Greece. Oh, that's that would have brought a conviction in the UK. Uh, he was passed fit to own a club by the EFL in 2017, but as we've learned, uh, their standards are questionable at best. Yeah. Um, Investigations into alleged match fixing and drug trafficking. He was charged with several serious offenses in 2019. He was cleared. He was charged with match fixing, but later acquitted. Now the Premier League is going to investigate this because their <laughs> test is more stringent. Yes. Because there's going to be an independent regulator at some point here, if ever, who knows? They'll, they'll probably fight about it for mm -hmm. another decade. Yeah. Um, he was clear to these things. Uh, he was the owner of Olympiacos. He was charged with match fixing in 2019, involvement in criminal gangs before being acquitted by the Court of Appeal two years later, so last year. 
Uh, no evidence he was accused of heroin smuggling. Um, UEFA investigated the match fixing claims. They brought no charges. There were charges brought in Greece, but then he was cleared. Um, Premier League have concerns. They're checking into all of it. Um, Marnakis, small family shipping business, built it into a vast fleet of tankers and container ships valued at more than two billion pounds. Um, does not exactly appear in any of the disqualifying conditions that the Premier League has. Uh, unspent criminal convictions, being disqualified as a director, being subject to insolvency proceedings. But they want to make sure that the things that he was charged with in Greece yeah. that would have resulted in a conviction in the UK, but maybe didn't in Greece, they need more info because if he would have been convicted in the UK, then he would not have been cleared to be able to own a Premier League team, which they weren't at the time, but they are now. Mm -hmm. So um, lots of different things. Uh, so this might be a little more complicated than just giving Cooper money to spend. Yeah. Uh, but we'll see. Yeah. Also one of the worst kept secrets uh, in the Premier League. It looks like uh, Dan Ashworth is leaving Brighton to be the new club sporting director at Newcastle that had been rumored for quite some time. And now it is officially official with, uh, contracts and things being signed. And so Dan Ashworth has now finally moved to Newcastle and let the Gareth Bale speculation begin. Because, just mentioned Gareth Bale, John. Yeah. So uh, we mentioned Gareth Bale. So let the speculation continue then. So there you go. <laughs> John doesn't listen to me half the time on the show. I'm learning. <laughs> well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to talk to folks on the Twitch pitch at the same time that I'm trying to advance storylines and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Gareth Bale might end up in five different places or he might retire and play golf. Um, who knows? Uh, a lot of it's going to depend on if Wales is going to the world cup or not, in my opinion, if yep. they don't. And he says, you know what? I'm done. I would not be shocked at all. We'll just have to wait and see on that. Um, Jarrett, let's dig a little deeper into Scotland and Ukraine. Um, Really good piece from Grant Wall, and I, I just cannot recommend enough subscribing to his newsletter. Uh, absolutely worth it. it. It's been, you know, there's there's a few that I subscribe to. His and John Arnold's on CONCACAF are the two best and must read for me every single time. And, and there was a really good piece that Grant had um, about Ukraine's preparation for this, which obviously is not ideal. Um you know, it's it's been really kind of throwing things together to to get ready for it. The players who are domestic players uh, in the Ukraine haven't played in a long time, um, and they had a lot of issues getting out of the country initially. And they've talked about that. Uh, there's a piece in the Guardian that goes into detail, and Grant spoke to the writer in, in his newsletter. They have played a couple of games against club teams. It's not really, you know, obviously the best preparation, but you do get half of the team that comes in from their European seasons ending outside of Ukraine. So it's going to be a weird mix and match. It's going to be difficult for them to be fully prepared for this as guys have, you know, kind of joined in late after their European seasons end. They were very good in the qualification process. They were very good defensively. Uh, Scotland was very good defensively as well. And that's another element here. Um, Ukraine, a little more variety in the goal scoring side of things. Um, Yuremchuk with three was the leader. Eight different players scored for Ukraine. Um, Scotland led in the attack by John McGinn and Lyndon Dykes with four apiece and Che Adams with three, but defensively Scotland, especially towards the end, Jarrett, they only allowed seven goals in total and they have not allowed one in their last three qualifiers. The offense got better. The defense got better. And I know a lot of the talk is going to be about Ukraine for obvious reasons in this, but Scotland has really built up over this qualifying campaign. And, I think they'd go in as the favorite regardless. Yeah, I think they are because I think they gave up seven goals. I think three of them were in one game against Denmark, three or four. Yeah. Um, and it, it was, it's to be expected. This was Denmark's group. Denmark just just absolutely rolled everyone in existence in this group. Um, and then Scotland kind of you know kicked and clawed their way to two. And they're pragmatic as hell. Um, 
if and Jason, you've watched some of their games. We've watched some of their games together. Like if you're looking for flair and fun and a high tempo offense, like this isn't going to be for you. Um, this no. is, it, this is going to be, it's going to be interesting too, because Kieran Tierney's not going to be available. And we've seen it in the past. And, um, during the Euros, I believe it was the Athletic, did a really good breakdown of how teams attack and the way that Scotland was is unique because of the way that they are able to get Andy Robertson and mm-hmm. Kieran Tierney on the field, who are both game changing left backs, but getting them on the field together and kind of overloading things on that left hand side. I want to see how they do it now because you don't have Tierney who is hurt because it's a day that ends in Y. Um he is just basically yeah. Scottish Mike Hampton. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see how they do it and how they manage the emotion of it because I could absolutely see Ukraine riding high on emotion and coming out and as good as they are defensively, trying to charge in, get a goal and swing the emotion in their way and try and ride that. But I think the longer it goes without a goal for me personally, it favors Scotland because it does it is it's gonna be in Scotland. A lot of Ukrainian fans there. It looks like it's from what I've seen on social media, a really jovial atmosphere. Everyone's having a good time. Um, a lot of unity between the fan bases right now, from what I've seen. But it's going to be two pragmatic teams, and somebody's going to flinch. And if it comes down to set pieces, especially, I like I like Scotland's edge in there, especially with a guy like Lyndon Dykes who can get on the end of something. And at the end of the campaign for qualifying up until now, has had a flair for the dramatic. A lot of late goals, just making something happen, just being there. It's it could be you know the recycled set piece that lands at the foot of John McGinn from twenty yards out, and he just cracks it. Um, and it could be, like, it, like I said, it could be Ukraine comes out riding the emotion of this opportunity. And if they can get up and then get defensive and basically force Scotland to try and break them down, it could be really tough. And it, it, could, it could come down to just weathering the start of that game. Head to head, they split. They played twice. Uh, each team's got to win. So, uh, you know, you don't have a lot of history between the two. Uh, Robertson, you know, he's coming off of a long season with Liverpool. Um, you know, can he dial it up two more times? Cause that, that's what you're asking. Cause again, you, you play Wales on Sunday. If you went, whoever wins here plays Wales on Sunday, which is, is not easy for these teams. Um, you know, you, Ukraine, I, I think the biggest thing for them is, is just going to be finding a way to find some chemistry. And it's going to be hard because it's hard in general with, uh, I think, Ukraine, because you have such a split in the guys who play domestically and the guys who don't. In this situation, you have the guys who don't play domestically, who have had normal seasons. Um, some of them have played a lot of games. Some of them haven't played as much, but they've had normal seasons, normal, normal campaigns, normal training, all those things. The ones who play domestically, yes, they've been in a training camp for about a month. Is that an advantage or a disadvantage? Because they haven't really played anything like normal. They they should be fresh, but are they sharp in a yeah, game? Yeah, like that's this? that's gonna be my question. Yeah, that's the one that you just don't know. And those clinical moments, where does it where are you on those? Yep. Yeah. Yeah who you lean on in those moments is going to be interesting. So go ahead. into your, into your point burned. Um, yeah. Scotland knows who they are, which is yeah. a damn sight better than they've been for the last 10, 15 years. But they had no idea. Like Steve Clark very much knows that they're a team that needs to play defensively to set up a block, get out at times. And when they do get out, rely on their skill players in the midfield because they are developing better skilled players, especially the ones who were down in England, um, but they're not, they, they're not, they're not a team that, that can play you wide open They're They'll get, they'll no. get destroyed. No, even in a game like this one where, you know, you look at it on paper and, and you could argue that like you look at the two teams, there's not a huge separation between the two, but Scotland's got to be themselves in this. And they're good enough to win these two games. Scotland is absolutely good enough to win these two games and, and get to the World Cup. I, it wouldn't be a shock if they did. It wouldn't be an upset. It wouldn't be any of that. Um, I think knowing who they are and knowing these situations is is going to help them. There is the question about 
how they adjust without Tierney. A uh, lot of you know thought about Liam Cooper probably filling into that role. Aaron Hickey on the right side. Uh, Nathan Patterson Aaron has had Hickey's ankle surgery. So he's out. He's I, young, I think about that. He's young, though. He is. Um, and this is a big moment for him. Don't know if he would have started if Patterson from Everton wasn't still recovering from mm-hmm. ankle surgery. So mm-hmm. uh, the left side is where I think they've had a big advantage with those two. And now you don't have those two. Um, in some ways, it's a little more clear cut. But you lose some of that dynamic ability with with both of them getting forward from the left. I want to see how we how we adjust how they set it up. I mean, do you yeah. I mean how do you do you play Dykes and and Shea together? Um, Shea Adams really good in the last few games with Scotland in getting in good position. Just wasn't clinical to finish, and then Lyndon Dykes didn't get to you an opportunity or two a game, and he generally puts it away. Um, it's ugly, and it's very it's very caveman at times but he's effective at it. And if you could play him as your target and play Jay off of him, I wonder if, you know, if that's how you want to kind of go about things. They love to go long anyway. Uh, They love to go over the top to him and then have runners coming off of him, like having John McGinn make that second run off of it. Numbers on this one. Scotland's a plus 130. Ukraine's a plus 260. Draw is plus 200 to go to extra time. What do you think, Jarrett? You think you're uh, talking about Scotland Wales on the weekend? I do, and I don't know, I man. Take, like, I feel, I, I feel kind of, I feel kind of dirty about it, you know? No, because it's, it's not Scotland's well, fault, and they can't come into it that way. And that's no, that, that's, and that's been a lot of about. the that's been a yeah. lot of the writing out of Scotland that I've seen is it's it's kind of walking this line of very respectful for Ukraine because they are just in one of the most unimaginable situations that you wouldn't wish on anybody, um, but that Scotland can't come into this with anything less than a killer mentality yeah because i think if you do get uh if you do get a couple goals early you can you want it either one of these teams gets a couple goals early i think you can kind of try and break the other one i think especially especially if scotland can get up on ukraine i think they can kind of break them a bit um, with with things but yeah you can't you cannot come in here with the oh we feel bad no because ukraine ukraine's out here to you know ukraine's out here for blood man they yeah, don't make a World Cup just like you do. And 100%. They, they've got they're gonna a lot be, to play for, obviously. Absolutely. And they got a lot of emotion stored up. And that what they lack in is what they lack in it, what they might lack in that finishing and those clinical moments. I make up for with, yeah, they should be fresh. And I wouldn't be surprised if you see them kicking in the last 15 minutes, like getting that runner's kick and really making the last 15 minutes of this game chaotic if it's close. The other big game today, uh, Italy, Argentina, the finalissima um, South American champions, UEFA champions. They're playing at Wembley in London. Uh, this is part of the partnership between Comma Ball and UEFA. Uh, you can go back in time. They, they had the, it was the Artemio Franchi uh, trophy that was, pre- that preceded the Confederations Cup. And now you're not going to have the Confederations Cup anymore. Uh, the Confederations Cup, grew to include champions from other continents um you had this a couple of times argentina had played in it once they beat denmark in in 93 it's it's an interesting event you know like if it's definitely more of a celebration it's a trophy and you put a trophy on the the touchline in front of some argentines and some italians they're going to fight over it so once it gets going i think it'll have some intensity to it but the the build up is all very you know, the party, you know, very, very fun atmosphere uh, for Italy. It's the biggest game they have of the year um, because they don't have anything else big after this outside of nations league. Uh, Roberto Mancini's kind of talked about it as the end of a cycle um, rather than looking ahead to starting the next one. I guess that starts immediately with nations league where they jump into that. Uh, Chiellini, for example, this is going to be his last game with the squad for Argentina. Um, you know, they don't have Nations League. So it's maybe a little bit different mentality for Lino Scaloni. It, it's a game that I think you can get a lot out of if you're Argentina and how seriously you take it and what you, you get out of this because you're not going to have Nations League games. You don't have any World Cup playoffs. You're going to have some friendlies, uh, but this is it. So this is important for them. I think probably more important for them. So it's it's a 
it's a weird one. I think a lot of the conversation from the Argentines, Scaloni, Messi, many of the players have said that they're just they're, they're shocked that Italy didn't qualify for the World Cup. It's just crazy that they didn't make it. They have a ton of respect for Italy. Obviously, there's a lot of cultural similarities between Argentina and Italy. I'm, I'm just curious to see how intense this game gets. I think it will. Yeah. I, I think pretty quickly into it, it will. Um, and then probably a lot of hugging it out afterwards. Italy comes in as the underdog plus 240, Argentina plus 130, the draws plus 200. Um, that feels about right with, with kind of where these teams are right now. I think for Argentina, they will definitely be more locked in from the jump than, than Italy just because of what they have coming up later this year. Italy, I just wonder where all of the motivation is. Like going out on a high for somebody like Chiellini is important, but you know, it's it's kind of a goodbye rather than the start of the build yeah. to get to a World Cup. So how does that go? I don't know. I don't know. It's an interesting game, and I think it'll be a fun one, and I think it'll be one to, to keep an eye on for sure. It also starts at 2.45 this afternoon. Yeah, no, I, I'm with Nick in the Twitch pitch. Nick says, we're, meaning Italy, is on vacation. The new cycle starts in Nations League. So my, my juice boxes would be leaning toward Argentina in this one. Mine would in general, um, just because I think it, it, where these teams are, uh, Argentina is the better team. I think Argentina is an outside contender to be a uh, World Cup winner. I, I don't think they're the top contender. I think Brazil is. Um, I think France is in that conversation a, as well. I think Argentina is in maybe the second tier that has a shot to win it. Um but that's a higher tier than I think Italy would have been if they had qualified. I think Argentina would have been a, a more likely World Cup winner than Italy. Um, it, that cycle, you know, we've had the conversations with Nick and on soccer over there. Italy's got to sit down as a footballing country and figure out how to develop young players. And they don't. And they don't do it consistently enough. And they have talent. You know, it's it's that that gap that I think the U.S. has struggled with at times, too, in in the last decade of – the young guys are good and they get up to a certain point. And then where do they get the games, the training, the combination of things that go from being a good youth player to a top international, a top professional? The U.S. struggled with that. They found some ways to bridge that gap. Italy is not. They, they don't prioritize playing young players in the league. Uh, there's too many clubs that don't. There are some that do, but there's too many that don't. And it's an issue and it's showing. And now they've got to figure it out quickly because if they don't, you're going to run into the same problems in the next cycle, even with an expanded World Cup where they, they should not miss because of the expansion of it. But if you're old and not developing young players, then, yeah, you're putting the stuff at risk. You're putting it at risk because a World Cup qualification cycle is different than a summer tournament. Summer tournament, you can be older and you can be veteran laden and you can get it done and you can dial up big performances and games and keep it tight and and win. In a, a qualification cycle, it's more like a season. It's a smaller one, but it is more like a season where, you know, at some point quality wins out. And last two cycles, Italy just hasn't been good enough. And they should be. There's no reason why the, that that's the case outside of not developing the young guys well enough. So. We'll see. Uh, questions on the Twitch pitch before we go. Uh, quickly, just going back to all of the the, the Charlotte discussion. Uh, I'll, I'll go with I'll go with this one. Sh Sean says, uh, "What's going on in Charlotte makes San Jose's front office look like all stars." Um, I, I mean, San Jose's front office. Like, I don't think they their front office has really done anything wrong. The question with San Jose is. How much money are they going to spend? How much money can they spend? It's not that their front office hasn't done a good job. I, I don't think. Um, this is its own category. Like, I, I, I just don't have another one. And it really just keeps coming back to if Swiderski is the reason, if that's, that's what's public right now. If other things come out, then other things come out and we'll see. But if Swiderski is the reason, because he didn't want to play for Ramirez coming after the break, I think they bet on the wrong person. Yeah. If if that if it comes down to that, if that ultimately is the biggest decision, I just don't think Swiderski is the guy to move on from one of the best coaches in the league who has gotten results. I just don't think he is. I don't think Swiderski is, but we'll find out. 
Michael Valverde, a vacuum of leadership allows for this kind of playground antics. Feels like new people wanted their coach instead, and Tepper allows those kinds of moves in his organization. I don't think that's fair, Michael, because Cornette has been there from the beginning, and he was really the one who spearheaded hiring Ramirez in the first place. So I I don't think Joe LeBeau is honestly making that decision. So no, I I don't think that's it. Um, if it is, then Cornette has been passed by LeBeau in terms of importance, and I don't I don't get that sense. Um, Kelly's been there up until, you know, fairly recently and he would have been heavily involved in the decision on Ramirez. I, I, I don't, I don't think the, the narrative fits that. I don't, I, I think it is more of something that has emerged. And I do think that there is something to the cultural differences between the way a, a manager is the way a manager works versus um, Europe and South America or, or Europe and, and Latin America um or or latin coaches in general if we, we want to just purely talk about miguel and hill ramirez as a spaniard um that's going to become more of a topic and i think you're going to have people try to make bigger narratives out i'm already seeing it Jarrett. we talked about it beforehand with the bruce arena uh training thing that matt turner mentioned where people start you know throwing that under the bus you have old school managers in every league and every culture you can find who don't have, want goalkeepers training out of the back that's not a mls thing that's a bruce arena thing and it worked pretty well for them last year in the regular season so it's hard to say like yeah that's that's just bad um but you're hearing things from different people about training and developing and it's weird because it's all muddled you know like Zlatan said things about the way the league was structured and people are trying to find that uh brian rodriguez's agent has said things about MLS developing young players rather than maybe talking about why his client didn't do so well at Almeria in Spain. Um, you know, it's just, it's weird. And then you have the flip side where Gabriel Heinze, and I don't know if anything was ever resolved with it, but Gabriel Heinze reportedly there were complaints made to the MLS players association about what he wanted to do in terms of training and how often they trained. Uh, reportedly there were issues with that. With Tata Martino. So, um, Boswell said they were with complaints when Tata was in, tar- yeah, was yeah, in charge. Yeah, no, there were. There were. Um, with Martino, Lasada got into this. Um, it's it's not cut and dried, I think, is what, it, what I keep coming back to with it. It's not cut and dried as to this is right and this is wrong. I think that's what people are going to try to do. And I don't think that's the proper way. But there are aspects of Major League Soccer in the way the league's structured and the way the competition is in having a players association <laughs> that changes the conversation for what managers can and can't do should or shouldn't do and how they avoid the situation that it seems like Ramirez has uh, found himself in. Um, the player power thing is another topic. Like there's so much to it that it's going to be really interesting to see if this is more of the anomaly or if this becomes more of a commonality. Yeah, it'll be, it, it'll be interesting. Cause I mean, you're always going to have those complaints. Cause I think coaches are always going to want to push that limit. Cause that's been the way in every sport is you're, you're pushing sport. guys, um, play coaches, push players and you have players unions to kind of keep that in check. And yeah, you're going to get complaints and then teams react to it. Like we said, Bobby Boswell said they had complaint. They filed complaints when Tata was here when he was when he joined the club. He has a I'll, I don't I can't find it. He has a really good Twitter thread where he talks about you know the way that they played in 2018, 2017, and 2018. Um, well, leading into 2018 yeah. about why they right. were successful. It's like you know right. they they were so drilled on that and they worked so hard at it. Um. And it was just constant work, and every club is going to be that way. Like, well, yeah, like you said, Lasada did did what he did. Um, you end up with you end up with the hindsight stuff last year. I mean, you end up with you know with with stuff going on in Charlotte. But clubs are going to be like that, and we might not hear about it in other countries because they don't necessarily have a players' unions that are going to file that and leak stuff out like that. And you have different expectations. I think, you know, MLS is a very diverse league. And I think that's something that will affect it more than it would in in Argentina or in Uruguay or, or in a, in Poland or, or, 
or Greece, you know, like there's more diversity of backgrounds and play styles and training styles and exposure to all those things in MLS than there are in other leagues in the world. And you add the players association component to it, which, you know, isn't going to matter for some players as much as it will for others. It's just, it's a, it's a lot of stuff that goes into this. Um, there's no indication that anything with Ramirez got to that point. It feels more like a player or players did not like Ramirez's either training methods or personality or whatever. Um, maybe there's more to it. Maybe there's not. But the cultural differences of players and managers in this league, maybe more than, than most, is, is going to be a very interesting subject going forward when you think about how you want to build a team. And that's another element of Charlotte that we we touched on a little bit at different points when we talked about it, but it, there were so many bigger points to get into that we didn't dig deep into it. You've got a very wide range of cultures in that team that have seemingly, even though it looked like it on the outside at, at points, have seemingly not found really the same page and maybe that's purely between the technical staff and the playing group and not amongst the playing group but it's going to get interesting going forward with you know Carujo's comments about loving everything that Ramirez has done I'm sure there's going to be others who are in that camp and now others who have not been in that camp and what that does in the locker room it's it's going to get really interesting if we hear more about this stuff so Keep an eye on it, but just in general, just the the cultural differences around MLS. Um, that's going to be a bigger topic going forward, I think. I agree with you. It's it's going to be interesting. Um, like I said, what happens in all sports, especially in the United States, and uh, well, you know, the, Bern- the training aspect happens in all sports. Yeah. I think in I think in soccer, we don't get this in like basketball, even though it's getting so much more diverse culturally with with players from other parts of the world. Um, right. American football, I mean. Pfft, everybody does the same kind of stuff generally outside of like tactics and stuff. Baseball yeah, is baseball. pretty homogenized. American baseball. Football. I think it comes up. Yeah. American football is definitely homogenized baseball. It comes up, but it's not from a training perspective. It's more like locker room kind of stuff and clubhouse kind of stuff where you get differences. Um, and I think in the soccer world, MLS is, is more unique than a lot of leagues because of how many international players are, are in the league. And the big differences in the way the game is done and feels and trained and, and all of it in South America, Central America, Africa, Asia, Europe, uh, CONCACAF, all of it. It's so different in all these different places. And that comes to a head at times in MLS. It's just an interesting um, experiment at, at times. And sometimes it bubbles over like what apparently is going on in Charlotte. 84 different nationalities in, in Major League Soccer this That's year. crazy. And if you think you're not going to have some conflicts with that, yeah, you are. You are. Uh, 7 o'clock tonight on ESPN, ESPN2 for USA Morocco hmm. uh, with John Champion, Taylor Twelman, and our friend Jillian Sakovitz will be on the sideline. Nice. But yeah, I mean that's that's it's it's cool to be able to see Jillian on the sidelines. But yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, you turned into a twelve year old for a second there. I funny. did nothing wrong with that. Nice. Uh, that was yeah, I did too. Uh, just just to let you know, your top ten in nationalities: uh, U.S. obviously, Canada, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, Uruguay, Ecuador, France, and England. That's your top ten. Pretty heavily Latin based league there, huh? Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of the others, the U.S. you're going to have some. Latino, some non-Latino. Uh, just, it's going to be fascinating. It's going to be a sociology experiment uh, going forward, and how clubs manage that. It seems like Charlotte did not, with seemingly a a designated player from Europe not getting along with the Spanish manager who has worked in South America to the point that he didn't want to play for him anymore, and to the point that the club said, "Okay." going to get very interesting as more of these issues pop up what else we got on the twitch pitch before we go uh question from nicks and let me get into that since we're talking about the the national team 
and it was a Matt Turner based question. So okay. as a USMNT fan, would you rather have Turner playing every day in a system unlike the USMNT or at Arsenal without playing time? I want his shot stopping. So I think his sharpness is more important. So you need every week playing time. Sharpness is more important because even, and this is a little bit based off the competition, um, even not training regularly in a team that builds out of the back, he's better with the ball at his feet than Zach Steffen. And if he's playing regularly, he's going to be sharper than Zach Steffen. So yeah, I, I want him playing regularly, period. That's the number one thing for me. Uh, Burned, what is your predicted twos lineup tonight? There's so, it's, I mean, it's impossible to, to like nail it. Luck. Um, yeah, I think Rocco Rios Novo will be part of it. Um, if not tonight, uh, he'll be part of it, you know, for this break. I think we'll see him with the group. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see Emenike with the group. I thought he, he played really well with the 19s in, in their match in UPSL on the weekend. I was really impressed with him. So I, I think we'll see him back with the group. Um, I think Jackson Conway has stayed with them during the break. Uh, I don't, well, we won't see Mikey Ambrose. I know that because he, he's taken a little bit of a vacation as most of the first team guys are. Um, I think it'll look pretty similar to what we saw in the last game with the addition of Rocco. And I think Emenike starts to get into the group. And I mean, you could see an Academy guy here or there who, who joins in there. Um, I don't know kind of what the hierarchy is right now. I thought Brendan Lamb looked good in the last game. I, I, I liked his performance. I, I like Lamb a lot in general. Uh, you know, maybe you see Brennan start as opposed to, to somebody else. Maybe you see Darwin Mateus get a start. But in general, I think Rocco and Emenike would be the additions to the group that we haven't seen uh, in the last game. Because uh, uh, David Mejia came back. He got some minutes in the second half. We saw Darwin Mateus in the second half. Uh, just wondering where uh, Mejia's minutes are. Do we see him for another 30 in the second half, too? Yeah. I mean, those, those are the questions coming in. But, yeah, with everything, it, you know, you had a midweek match against Orange County, and now you've got this one coming up against RGV, and RGV was in a shootout with uh, San Antonio FC over the weekend. We did a Friday match against Orange County, not quite midweek, but a little more rest than RGV. Yeah, and so uh, RGV in the South Texas t South Texas Derby match. It was five. It was five goals, and San Antonio FC got the win. But they're coming. They're coming in on short rest, and so uh, I want to see how they look in addition to what we're looking at from Atlanta United too. Also, yeah, RGV's got a bunch of new faces from previous years. They do have a few guys that I, I've liked for a long time. Uh, Juan David Cabezas, who was with Houston, Colombian holding midfielder who had injuries that kind of derailed his time with the Dynamo. Uh, Francisco Torres, former U.S. men's national team player, uh, was with Colorado Springs last year. He's at RGV, really just, just smooth player on the ball. I've always felt like he was an underrated guy in the national team mix. Didn't get enough time. I don't think he was somebody that, that Klinsman really valued all that much. Um, Klinsman didn't really value having the ball very much. So uh, Taurus wasn't going to fit a uh, couple other guys in that group that I, I really like. So I think it'll be a fun one. I think it could be a high scoring one, potentially uh, Atlanta looked much better defensively in the last match. Um, but they haven't looked great defensively this season, and you know they're going to take chances, and you know they're going to get numbers forward. And, and RGV, you know, is a team that can score goals but also give up goals. Yeah, they've added uh, Adolfo Hernandez as well. Finally, after getting his international paperwork squared away, and you mentioned Torres. I mean, uh, 2010 World Cup experience there too. So I mean, it's uh, it should be a fun one tonight on a bunch of different levels. Looking forward to it. What else we got on the Twitch pitch? Anything uh, Let's see. Uh, Bart's uh, about uh, men's national team. We'll stick with that for the moment. Uh, we really don't need to see chemistry building between Zimmerman and Long. We really don't need both of them in, uh, in Qatar. It's a wasted opportunity by Burhalter to see Eric Palmer Brown play meaningful minutes. But what else is new? Yeah, I mean, Bart's always down on that side of things when it comes to Greg Burhalter. I get it. Uh, we'll talk to Bart tomorrow about what we see. Um, no, I mean, honestly, I think he it's not about building chemistry. I think he's giving Aaron Long the first opportunity to show that he's going to play next to Zimmerman. And I think Zimmerman's starting. I think Zimmerman is locked into a spot. I think his performances have earned him that spot. I, I don't have any problem with it. 
Uh, I think Long's getting the first opportunity over, you know, Cameron Carter Vickers and Eric Palmer Brown. Um, we'll see if Long takes it. Uh, I don't know if he will or not. I, I frankly don't know. Uh, he fits the system, obviously. Uh, and, and that's a big part of this. I, I think you cannot discount that the idea of fitting the system with a, a team. And I do think Burhalter has dialed it back from the capital T capital S trademark at the end system to having a way that they play a system, which is what you should have. Um, where you got to have the players that fit. Like I just mentioned with, with Doris, um, he did not fit the way Klinsman wanted to play. He would have actually fit pretty well in his prime with the way that, that Burhalter wants to play. It, sometimes it happens with national teams. It's just how it goes. So we'll see if Long's the guy. Um, I don't think it's about building chemistry because I don't think Long is necessarily the starter next to Zimmerman. I don't think that's decided. I think it's an opportunity for Long to show that he should be. And we'll see if he does. I think Zimmerman is starting. Zimmerman is starting and could be a factor in the leadership, possibly wearing the armband. I know that you know, has moved around a lot. and doesn't really matter as much with this group, but Zimmerman will be a leader in the group. And if he wore the armband in the World Cup, I wouldn't have an issue with it or be shocked. I think Zimmerman's a locked-in starter if he stays healthy. Johannes feels that Cameron Carter-Vickers had the best season of any Euro-based center back. He deserves a chance. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm wondering is just, you know, are you going to see Long and CCV and Palmer Brown get a chance during these games? Or has Burhalter already made up his mind? I would assume that he has not made up his mind because I don't think Aaron Long has showed enough coming back from injury for that to be locked in. And you've got to see it. I agree. I think Cameron Carter Vickers had the best season of the the European based guys, and he should get a look. I 100% agree that he should get a look. I think Long on paper maybe is a little bit better fit, um, but Cameron Carter Vickers is probably coming in in the best form. So maybe he gets the game on on Sunday against Uruguay, and, and then we'll have a different conversation about it next week. But he deserves a look, no question about it for me. I don't think anybody is locked in outside of Zimmerman on the back line uh, at center back. Uh, Ricky Ricardo, back to the twos quickly. He says he's missed the last couple of twos matches. How's Heimar done? Um, I mean, we, we hadn't seen him start until this one. So, I mean, coming off the bench late in games, so-so. Uh, I like him going forward a lot defensively. He's got work to do. Um, he's an interesting prospect. I, To me, in terms of guys like that that have come in that are the most interesting prospects, Nelson Orji has become that for me. Uh, Nigerian center back who I think has a lot to give and has a lot of room to grow um, and has the potential to get there. I've been blown away by him. Uh, Haimar, I, I, I think, is is impressive, but I'm not in its limited minutes. I'm not to the point where I'm like, yeah, he's, he's ready to go and he, he could start an MLS. I don't know that yet. With Nelson Orji, I'm leaning a little more that way. It's still more to see, more development to, to be made. But I'm seeing him as closer to an MLS player. And he's the one who's really grabbed my attention uh, out of the incoming guys uh, this season, non-academy. All right. I admit I'm flying around here with topics. That's fine. Uh, Jarrett, Couple more. Okay. Jarrett from BAM, who is staying up late with us. He, he's, he's gone into stoppage time with us down in Australia. Would it be smart for sporting to make the change at head coach? Ooh. No, you do it a lot of work if you do that because uh, Vermes Verm also runs front office. That's a that's a that's a Bill Belichick style system. Um, also, they've I mean, if you want to criticize like the build because they didn't get you know cover for a six or cover for a striker, that's that's understandable. But I, everything I he has done, that. so everything he has done in his history has been great. Um, if this became like a, a consistent problem over like two years, you can have that conversation. But again, you're going to be changing out the technical director too, because he is more than just the coach there. Yeah, I I do have an issue with them not re-signing Ilya because uh, I think they got worse and they didn't really uh, improve it. I, I have an issue with that. Um, but he's lost Polito. He, he's lost Gaddy Kenda. That's killed that team. I don't know how much you can count on Polito going forward either, man. Like no. it just at this point, I'm wondering if you just you got you might have to cut bait and well, go find another striker. You got to be a little a little fair in that he was injured and he opted not to have surgery to try to come back, so he played and he he wasn't himself, and then they decided he needed the surgery. So it's not multiple injuries; it's one injury that has been extended. 
Um, so I'm not quite, I'm not so sure there yet, but you're, you're going to run out of time on his contract and you're probably not going to renew it right now with where things are. You got to wait and see until he gets healthy and make that decision. Um, I don't think they should fire Peter Vermes. I think that would be a failure because they had the best regular season in the Western conference outside the last 30 seconds where they honestly, uh, were screwed over. So they should have finished as the number one seed in the West last year. And this year, I think it's explainable as to where they are. Now, part of the explanation is not re-signing Ilya. And I would, you know, if I'm ownership, and I would assume they were involved in that decision, uh, if they were against it, like not bringing him back, and Vermes was like, we don't need to bring him back, we can do this, we can do that, then ownership would have a leg to stand on to say, you know, hey, we wanted to bring him back. You said we didn't need him. You were wrong. But if ownership was like, yep, we agree with you, let's do it, then they really can't say anything about that, can they? So that's my biggest issue. The the results this season, injuries have been a huge part of it. And it goes to show a little bit of the conversation about Atlanta and getting the results that Gonzalo Pineda has with even more injuries throughout the spine of the team. And now the fullback position is getting decimated. To be competitive where Kansas City has not been, it's a credit to what Pineda's done more so than a dismissal of what Vermes has done. I think Vermes should be back next year. Question to the floor from Byrne in our discussion about Miguel and Hill Ramirez. He said, Byrne was wondering whether NYCFC would hire Ramirez if Dyla goes back to Europe after the season. He would be such a perfect fit for their system and roster, and I'm sure they noticed that after seeing him coaching MLS. Yeah, he would be. He'd be, he'd be a great fit for them. Um, I don't think he'll be out of a job that long. Uh, I, I think somebody will snap him up. I think there's just too many good qualities about him to not be working until the end or until honestly the beginning of next season. Uh, but if he is available and if Dyla left, yeah, he would be a very good hire to, to continue the idea that they play with while putting his own stamp on it. You know, I had this conversation with people in general about philosophies and, and where you go. I mean, Philosophies are pretty broad and and vision statements, really. Um, They're not detailed like we play like this and we play in this shape and we play this way and we have this kind of player and we have this. It's very broad. And Ramirez fits into the broad philosophy of the way that NYC plays and develops young players and the kind of players that they sign would fit what he wants. Like there's a lot of things that fit. He's a different manager than Ronnie Dyla. And that's fine. You know, when you see a team that has a similar philosophy but has different managers come in and put their spin on it, that's a good thing because it keeps it fresh as opposed to a style being so defined by one person that it's hard to follow up on. I think Leeds has shown that if you put some thought into it and you don't just hire somebody to hire somebody, but you say, all right, Bielsa is one of those guys that is very – this is me. This is Marcelo Bielsa. And you say, well, who can follow that? You have to take some aspect of what makes Bielsa's philosophy his, because it wasn't Leeds philosophy coming in. I mean, Leeds didn't really have one. Bielsa brought that, but to follow up, you have to look at it and say, all right, how can we follow this up? And Jesse Marsh following it. There is some logic to that. There is, there's some things that he can build on. There's some things that he does very differently than Bielsa, but there are some similarities. That's the harder question. And Almeida following him in San Jose, it's not going to be an easy decision unless you just let Cavello run it out this year, make a decision. And, you know, maybe that's enough time to, to get away from the Almeida way, but it's hard for NYC. If they move on from Dyla who fit to follow, you know, Vieira who or, or Dolme and, and, you know, outside of Christ who honestly, I think, kind of fit into it as well because manchester city's way is what city looks at uh, new york city and city football group the pep way which is not rigid which is positional play which has managers who put their spin on it underneath nyc has followed that pretty well in different ways since but in different ways they've done it miguel angel ramirez would fit into that um I just don't think he's available at that stage. Ronnie Dylas fit into it a little bit better than I thought. But as we said, you know, when he was hired, he was somebody that was kind of around the city football group side of things, even if he wasn't a CFG 
manager, he was somebody that they knew of and knew that he could come in and have the right approach to fit the way they wanted their team to look. He's done a great job. And Ramirez, I think, would be an even easier fit to walk in and, and play in that manner. Last question on the board comes from Nix. And he asks if there's any news on the World Cup kerfuffle in Conmebol and the possible loss of a spot of Ecuador. No, because I don't think there's much to it in the first place. Um, there hasn't been an update. Uh, again, I think the only way that Ecuador would have games taken away from them is if there is evidence that they falsified things that led FIFA and Conmebol to giving them the approval to play the player in the first place, which is what they had. Um I have not seen any indication of that. It has been the same argument that has come up multiple times that did not lead to them not being allowed to play the player in the first place. They were given the okay. You'd have to find out that they lied or falsified things to get the okay. And I have not seen any insinuations that that's the case. But no, no updates as of yet. And uh, one last note from Bam. You know, we were talking about uh, Ukraine and Scotland. Mm -hmm. And Bam says that the Afghanistan women's team is currently playing in the Victorian uh, state in Australia. Domestic women's competition, Melbourne Victory, are sponsoring them to play in the competition right now. So very, very cool down in Australia. Yes, that's very cool. Um, Love to see that kind of stuff. Uh, Very cool in Melbourne Victory to do that as well. Um, It's a little bit different um, in like the situation with Ukraine. I mean you're going to have to figure out how you deal with the domestic league going forward in those clubs. And I don't remember if UEFA, I know the Russian clubs aren't participating this year, but I don't know how they determined how qualifiers for European competition would come from the Ukrainian league and how those clubs are going to be able to participate in what that looks like. Um, I don't know if you can replicate something like that with Ukraine. It's going to be complicated, but it's going to be a, a big issue um, for UEFA going forward. It's not the biggest issue for Ukraine, obviously, but it's going to be a big issue in, in how you handle that and, and what those clubs can do. And then from a business perspective, you know, what happens with those clubs and players who are under contract with those clubs, um, it's, it's something you don't really plan for. So we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, one more thing really quick, uh, and we, we didn't get into it yesterday with the Ramirez news, the back and forth between Liverpool, um, UK government officials and French officials um, after French officials came out and basically blamed Liverpool fans in different ways. It feels like the story's changed every five minutes. Um, the French interior minister who put the blame on Liverpool fans and, and talked about thirty to 40,000 fake tickets. Uh, that individual, uh, Darmanin, Darmanin, he's now said that there were hundreds of fake tickets, not 30 to 40,000. Um, that's a little different than what was said publicly. And this has been handled in a very embarrassing manner from the French government. And UEFA has created an independent commission to investigate what happened. Um, there are so many mistakes with the way that this was structured for Liverpool fans to come in. And then the blame game afterwards is disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. So uh, there's going to be more to come on this. And French interior ministers should maybe look at what happened at Saint Etienne and get a little more involved in that than blaming Liverpool fans for something that the security officials and the planning of logistics at the Stade de France created more than Liverpool fans showing up late or coming with 30 to 40,000 fake tickets. And oh yeah, by the way, uh, France, uh, we're in the modern times now where you can have a, a ticket that's actually mobile instead of having paper tickets. The what, the biggest event in world club football uh, had paper tickets in 2022. Um, you kidding me? You kidding me, France? And then you want to talk smack about it? Like, come on. Come on. Uh, that's going to get uglier as we go. So more stories and, and recriminations and walkbacks and all of it are going to happen. Just get ready for it. It's disgusting. Uh, that's going to do it for us tonight, 730 ESPN2. If you can't join us at Fifth Third Bank Stadium, John and I will be on the call for RGV and Atlanta United 2. We'll talk about it tomorrow. 
Bart Keeler at 9.30 to talk U.S. and Morocco. 10.30, Nico Moreno, and we'll get his perspective on Miguel Angel Ramirez. He saw Charlotte last under Ramirez. Um, he talked to Carujo last week. We'll get some more perspective from him uh, about that move and everything else going on in MLS, and we'll talk some national teams as well with Nico. That's tomorrow. Y'all have a good rest of the day. Mucho plato, y'all. Mucho plato, y'all. Mucho plato, y'all.